All right, good evening, everyone. This is a special meeting of the Downers Grove Grade School District 58 Board of Education here on Wednesday, August 18th, 2021, at 6 p.m. at the Downers Grove Village Hall. This meeting is being live streamed for the public on the Village of Downers Grove's YouTube channel. Kevin, will you please go roll? Member Doshi. Here. Member Hannes. Here. Member Harris. Here. Member Olchak. Here. Member Weiner. Here. And Board President Hughes. Here. Tonight, members of the audience will have an opportunity to provide public comment to the board later on in the agenda. The board asks that anyone wishing to comment to please fill out a card and indicate the topic to be addressed. Then place them in the basket over on the table there to my right. Uh, as we no longer have limits on in-person attendance, we will not be taking remote comments. I have allotted 30 minutes tonight, but we will extend it if necessary. Uh, we'll also be having a public hearing on uh, an e-learning portion that will be a separate part at the beginning and specifically on that topic. So to kick us off today, let's start with the flag salute. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, first on tonight's agenda is a public hearing on the initial proposal for an e-learning plan. I'd like to introduce Justin Sissom uh, for a comment here. Thank you. As the board is aware, we have discussed the e-learning plan at both the June and July Board of Education meetings, but for anyone in our audience who did not hear those discussions, just by way of a brief summary, this is a plan designed around emergency days only, and the approval of the plan would allow us the option of implementing an e-learning day in lieu of a traditional emergency day, often thought of as a snow day. The plan doesn't mandate the use of e-learning, but allows the administration the flexibility to, once it has been deemed unsafe for students to physically attend school, determine whether we would declare an emergency day, which would be made up in June, or an e-learning day. We surveyed our families and staff as to whether they felt District 58 should have an e-learning plan, and a strong three-quarters majority of responses, over 900 total responses from both staff and families, were favorable. Among nearly 300 open-ended responses, there were certainly strong individual opinions, both for and against e-learning in general. There were also some comments expressing concern regarding using this plan as a response to COVID. And to clarify again, this e-learning plan would only be used for locally declared emergency days. And we have a maximum of five such days allowed by the state. There was also definitely an observed theme in the comments of using these days judiciously, which aligns with everything our administrative team has shared. We do see the value in the occasional true snow day. We also recognize that there are situations where an e-learning day in, in January or February may well be preferable to an on-site learning day in mid-June. And so later tonight, the board will be asked to vote to approve this plan, which would allow us to then send the e-learning plan to the Illinois State Board of Education for its final verification. Okay. Thank you. Uh, at this time, then, I declare the hearing open to allow members of the audience to comment on this topic. Anyone wishing to be heard, please stand, come to the podium, state your name and attendance area or organization if there is any. Um, for the record, please, and then state your comment. Good evening. I'm Kathy Mayhay. I'm a teacher at Herrick and co-vice president of the DGEEA. <clears throat> I'm here to share a teacher perspective on the e-learning plan. First, teachers learned a great deal about remote learning and teaching during the last school year. We honed our tech skills, and we feel confident that should an e-learning day be needed, we're in a good position to deliver and execute high-quality remote lessons in an efficient way. There is no doubt in our minds that we, together with our students, can do it, and we can do it very well. Second, the benefit to being able to implement an e-learning day if the need should arise is that it helps to preserve the continuity of learning and it allows us to capitalize on student engagement. So what do I mean by this or what do we mean by this? The continuity of learning. When we're in school, we often introduce a new skill in the earlier part of the week. At this stage, there is direct instruction, some guided practice, and as the week moves on, you know, Tuesday through Friday, students move along the learning curve doing more independent practice and applying and synthesizing the newly acquired skills. They're actively engaged in the process. 
When my French students come to my room, sixth period, they know, for example, that we've been working on this very strange thing called adjective agreement because nouns have genders in foreign languages. And they're ready to work. They have questions. They need clarification. Or they're ready to really use the new material and show me what they can do. When we have an unplanned day off, the learning is interrupted. The rhythm is thrown off. And we aren't capitalizing on the high level of student engagement that we've had together in the classroom. If we can connect with our students from home, the interruption is minimized. We've still got them. And we can make the most of their interest. We preserve the continuity of learning. Finally, and I believe this was mentioned in the last meeting, the reality is that student engagement wanes toward the end of the year. That's not something any of us like to acknowledge, but it's true. There is a fatigue that we try our best to keep at bay, but it is there, especially when the weather gets hot and our buildings heat up. For these reasons, we believe that an e-learning day in, for example, the middle of February is more valuable than a day tacked on in the second week of June. For these reasons, we respectfully ask that you vote yes to filing an e-learning plan to enable us to very judiciously use these days. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? I just want to make one point that I don't think has been made in, in uh, the recent meetings, and I've, for other reasons, attended the recent meetings. Um, I think a lot of good points have been made about this. I really do think that an e-learning plan is a wonderful idea, if only because through all of the horrific year of COVID, as teachers have learned, the administration has learned, and one benefit, one of the few benefits of this year is that given that experience, they will be able to effectively or more effectively than they would have a year ago take advantage of the learning day. So I do think it's a good idea, and maybe there are details that need to be worked out, but at the end of the day, I think it is a good idea. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Anyone else? Okay, there being no further comments, I now declare this hearing closed at 6.07 p.m. All right, we have one item up for discussion tonight, and that is our return to learn plan, uh, both Dr. Russell and Mr. Sissel. And uh, Jessica Stewart's also okay. going to be uh, joining us this evening for this presentation. So I'd like to thank everyone uh, for coming out today and for those that are listening online uh, regarding our return to learn plan. As everyone is aware, uh, the school year starts uh, a week from tomorrow and we have published a plan under board docs earlier in the week, uh, shared the plan with our staff and the intention of this uh, presentation is part of an overview of our plan moving forward for this uh, school year. The goals of this presentation, uh, we want to review District 58's overarching goals. Uh, we want to update the community on current mandates and or guidance related to COVID-19. Uh, the real intention though is to provide an overview of the student's day. So we have structured this presentation from kind of the time when the student wakes up in the morning to the time they go home at night. I also want to celebrate in this presentation. Uh, for those of you who have uh, been tuned in over the last 17 months, uh, the presentation last August was much different than this presentation. We are talking about our students being back five days a week, fully in person, and school will look very similar to what it did uh, pre-pandemic, which I think is reason to celebrate and something that I know our staff is very excited for, uh, the administration is very excited for, and uh, speaking as the father of seven school-aged children, I can guarantee you that our kids are excited to come back uh, fully in person. Throughout this pandemic, we have been very clear on our priorities as a school district. It's been our guiding light. Um, so what we're really aiming to do is to provide an experience as closely aligned to what it looked like prior to the pandemic while we maximize in-person instruction. We know that kids learn best um, when they are in the classroom and connected to their teachers, and that is something that we strive to do. 
health and safety of our students and staff is always very important. Another very important thing is minimizing disruptions to the educational process. And then finally, adhering to the CDC, ISB, and IDPH guidelines in terms of best practices for health. One of the biggest things that school districts throughout DuPage County, Illinois, and the nation as a whole are currently experiencing is the debate on masks. I want to just put that out there right now. I know several people are here tonight to specifically talk about masks. There are varying views on this topic. I can assure you that we've heard from both sides and there are strong opinions on both sides of the mask debate in our country, in our county, and then here inside Downers Grove. Regardless of how we feel, per the Illinois State Board of Education, the governor has mandated masks in all public and private schools, and the State Board of Education has made it clear to us that that carries the weight of law. We must follow the mandate, or we risk losing our recognition status, losing state funding, and losing insurance coverage, which can expose the district to significant liability. This is not an idle threat from the State Board of Education. Last week, we saw Timothy Christian, a private school in Elmhurst, attempt to go against this guidance, and they were immediately slapped with losing their recognition. There was an article in the Daily Herald, I believe, about 21 downstate districts that have attempted to do this, and once again, they lost their recognition status or in the process of doing that. Under the previous mandate, there was a school district in Southern Illinois that tried to do that, and they once again were immediately notified that they were going to lose their recognition status. As superintendent, I cannot recommend a plan that would put in jeopardy our recognition status or the loss of state funding. While we do want to be responsive to questions about masks in the mandate, I want to remind everyone that this is a mandate from the state of Illinois. The guidelines come from the state of Illinois. Questions or concerns about state mandates are best directed at the state level. Local school, school boards cannot put in place a mask mandate for the entire state. And what we see happening across the country is local school boards who have to abide by these mass mandates are really taking the heat on both sides of this when really it has nothing to do with the local school board. This is from the governor of the state of Illinois. Again, we have shown time and time again that we are going to adhere to the guidance. We've adjusted both ways. Sometimes the guidance loosen up or loosens up, excuse me, and the school district follows suit. Sometimes it can be more tighter in the school district follows suit. I remind everybody of last November when many districts were going remote. I was heavily criticized because we kept our kids in school. We were following the guidance. Many people referred to that as reckless or we were playing loose with the science. No, we were following the guidance. Now we're following the guidance and we're being criticized because we are you know, being too conservative and things like that. We're not being conservative or liberal or any of that. We are just following the guidance that's in front of us. But I will remind our community, because I get calls for this all the time, we will not put in place more restrictive measures than what the science and the guidance call for. I have all sorts of, of, of you know, people contacting me saying, kids need to be in two masks, or we need a HEPA filter in every single classroom, and we need this and that. We're not doing those things. We are following the guidance in what it says. So what does this guidance say in terms of masks? Students must wear a mask and they must follow safety guidelines, as does our staff. Students will not be permitted to attend school if they do not wear a mask and or refuse to follow the safety protocols. We are aware that some families are opposed to mask wearing. But we do ask for your partnership and compliance with mandates and guidance. We're an elementary school district. That bond between the child and the principal and the child and the teacher is something that is extremely important. And we don't want to put children in a position where they have to defy their principal or their teacher. We need to focus in on learning. And I want to plead with the community to let's focus on coming together, moving forward for the sake of the kids and not having the mass mandate debate with our children as they enter school because they will not be allowed to attend school if they do not have a mask on. That is per the state order, per the mandate, and something we have to follow. Last winter, when we made the difficult decision of switching <clears throat> teachers in order to get more full-time instruction, we had someone come up and make a public comment and it really resonated with me. This parent was against 
what we were doing and what the school board voted yes on in my recommendation. But the parent came up here and very eloquently spoke about, while I'm against your decision, I am gonna move forward for the sake of the kids and to make sure that we can all come together as a community. That's something that we've done very well throughout the pandemic. And I wanna encourage everyone, I, I really do believe that's why we fared better than just about every other district locally, because we always have the ability to come together. And that is what I wanna to continue to stress to everyone, um, regardless of where you fall on this issue. With that, I wanna turn it over to Justin and Jessica, and we are gonna start a student's day and really start prior to arrival because there are changes in the guidance. Um, I think many of these changes will be welcome and uh, we wanna share those. Go ahead, Jessica. Absolutely, and really the goal here is to help our families understand what the day is gonna look like for their children uh, as they're coming, as they're starting their day and moving through it. So. You know, when we look at prior to arrival, the biggest change here is perhaps uh, that there will no longer be a need for uh, daily certification and temperature screening. So as layered mitigation system effectiveness was reviewed uh, last year, this was one that was pulled off as a recommendation by the health department. Uh, we do though ask that families continue to be vigilant for any signs of infectious disease and to keep their children home if, uh, if they're symptomatic in any way, uh, if there's any question and we can help kind of support some of those questions associated with that. Um, our nurses in each of our buildings and our, our school health services. Uh, we'll also be starting um, the school year with limiting guests to those who are essential to the day-to-day -day functionings during school hours. Uh, we do hope to provide more access to our schools in the long term this school year and we'll be reviewing uh, that layered mitigation system um, a little bit later in the fall um, that being said we are going to be hosting um, meet the teachers we're going to be hosting curriculum night but families can expect to see some additional um, mitigation health and safety uh, pieces in safe uh, in place during that time uh, and again we'll be revisiting those protocols once we've got those routines uh, back up and established again Related to transportation, there aren't major changes really from last year. Um, we are going to have our school offices work closely with the health department, or I'm sorry, with the, our transportation company uh, to make sure that we've got seating charts in place that uh, make sense for the students. Uh, that's gonna assist with close contact tracing. Um, as it was previously, uh, there those, you know, the three to six feet for close contacts don't apply on the bus. So being able to know who sat where is really uh, critical to our work. Um, and, and as was the case as well before, disinfection will continue every night. Um, this too will look very comparable uh, to what it did last year uh, with, without the addition of symptom screening occurring. Uh, we'll be staggering our uh, entrance times, uh, so it will be helpful for our families to continue to drop off as close to that arrival time as they're able. Um, and we ask that parents don't congregate, and everybody really remembers that rule, uh, both inside and outside. We're using terms with students uh, of, of arm's length, uh, really to give a visual to what that three feet might be. Uh, each of our buildings will have a unique plan. That's kind of the way in Downers Grove with each of our building layouts looking a little bit different. So uh, those, those unique plans will be linked on our return to learn protocol um, so that families can see what each of our buildings are doing all in one spot. So if you're, if you're mitigating multiple drop-offs, uh, you don't have to be searching around through your email to find the principal's plan. Uh, and then uh, as has been the case, we'll continue to stress hand hygiene as students are entering the building and entering their classrooms. Uh, this is just that reminder that uh, we did see a change to the definition of close contact. Uh, students will not be considered close contacts uh, as long as they were within, uh, they weren't less than three feet as long as masking is strictly adhered to. Um, if masking isn't consistent, then, then close contact then follows that older definition that we're all used to, bless you, from last school year. And then uh, another change is that fully vaccinated individuals who remain asymptomatic uh, and those that have uh, had COVID in the last 90, 90 days would be excluded from quarantine. 
And so as we look at what the instructional day will look like based upon that guidance and, and an attempt to minimize any close contact at school, students will be spaced at three feet in their instructional spaces in nearly all settings. And we say nearly all because we are in the process of staging every single classroom across the district. Our goal is to accomplish it 100% as we, as we did in, in last year's scenarios. If there were to be a situation where we would have to be within three feet at any specific place, we would communicate that and explain how it would work and, and work with seating charts. But again, we expect that to be very minimal. As we did last year, we're going to continue to creatively teach our, our kids the, the, the ways to work through this positively and continue to practice these habits that they're actually really good at since last year. We do want to continue to, to consider physical distance throughout the building. So while we will be moving through hallways and utilizing lockers and cubbies and all of those things as in a typical year, we'll put some structures in place so that we don't have an entire class out at cubbies at the same time, but maybe students 1, 4, 7, 10 and something like that so we can use those tools but also maintain spacing as available. And then we want to highlight that this plan uh, that we're talking about really applies to everybody. Um, although some of our students may require some specialized planning and I really I want to give a lot of credit to our special education teams um, Things went really well last year and that was really because of the partnerships we had with our families and thinking creatively and out of the box to ensure that Regardless of what a student's uh, needs were that uh, we were able to provide uh, to them a quality education so that that will continue to be the case this year so as we think about our elementary buildings, truly the, the most exciting thing that I can find in all of this is that we are going to be able to return to the instructional strategies and the pedagogical tools that we have embraced and trained our teachers in to be outstanding. Students will be able to work in small groups. Students can share materials. They can, they can use math manipulatives. They can, we don't have to quarantine preschool toys anymore. All of that has lifted from the guidance with the emphasis on continued hand hygiene so that we ensure that as we move between environments, we are maintaining that. And as I mentioned earlier, we can move throughout the classroom into different instructional spaces. So math students can move from classroom to classroom and centers can exist in, in primary classrooms. We still need to identify the three foot distancing within those experiences, but multiple students can move through those instructional spaces in a given day. When we talk about three foot spacing, again, this is pretty typical spacing when you think about what our classrooms look like. That picture on the upper left shows a pod of desks. There's just a little bit of extra distance to make sure that we're compliant with that full three feet. But as we look at this variety of classroom settings, it looks very similar. Some are in rows, but others are in pods, and we no longer have the same restrictions on students facing the same way and all of those kinds of things. So much of our traditional classroom furniture can be used. The reality is a lot of the flexible seating and some of those collaborative tables that we've seen in a lot of classrooms may not be able to be in use. And so we are in the process of purchasing and continuing to acquire individual student surfaces for those uh, types of scenarios to get to that three foot spacing in our classrooms. And so these are elementary examples. We talked about when unmasked, we need to be six feet apart. And so that includes obviously eating in our elementary schools. So again, we are putting multiple structures in place to ensure that we can maintain that six foot distancing while eating. Eating lunch outside opens up a, a myriad of possibilities and makes things actually a lot easier, but it does rain on some days. And so when we have to be inside, we're making sure that we are going to utilize all of our available spaces for lunch so that, so that our students can have that six foot of distance. And that means if you, can, if you think about what our typical elementary lunch rooms would look like two years ago, we would have a lot of tables brought out from the walls and we'd have 10 or 12 kids at those tables pretty much at elbow to elbow that furniture is prohibitive to be able to make that six foot distancing happen. So this is another case where we are ordering individual student lunch surfaces that can be used for different purposes in the future, but in the, in the thousands, honestly, to be able to accomplish this. And we're fortunate that we have federal ESSER funds for, for items just like this that allow us to return to in-person instruction with some unanticipated expenses. So there's a, a, all of that to say there's just a lot of work going on right now to ensure instructional and, and lunch settings that are going to keep kids in school by not creating those close contact scenarios. Um, snacks at the, at the elementary level is something we would like to see happen, but again, we, we only would want that to happen if we can achieve six foot distancing. 
It will be possible in some classrooms, but not all. Again, outside is a great place to eat a snack, but it, on the days when we may not be able to get outside, we're just going to have to acknowledge there may be some flexibility in that. That's all going to be developed at the building and really the classroom level. Our hope is to have snack daily. The reality is that we will only want to really, though, have snack when we can accomplish it outside or with six-foot distancing. Mm -hmm. Recesses will look like recesses. Students won't be wearing masks. Our playground equipment will be available. We're still encouraging distancing because though you can't be defined as a close contact outdoors, certainly we still want to encourage that arm's length distance as best we can. <laughs> and so we will encourage kids to keep some distance while playing. And we might say that certain grade levels have access to certain pieces of playground equipment on certain days just to minimize the congregation in, in certain places on the playground. Again, these are things that we will put in place and observe based on each building's um, recess populations, how many kids are out at one time and what that scenario looks like. Obviously, we also want to encourage other opportunities for mask breaks during the day. It could include snack time. It could include read alouds. It could include lessons that are conducive to heading outside and having that mask break time. And so that will, again, all be coordinated at the building level. Focusing on middle school for a moment, again, closely resembling our pre-pandemic times. So students will follow that eight period schedule and students will move from classroom to classroom just as they would in a typical year. Again, we'll want to identify some traffic patterns and some time blocker usage so we don't see a lot of congregating and a lot of potential you know, close contact type of scenarios. We will, as in a typical year, once we're a couple weeks into the school year, students will change for PE as they always have. Similar to elementary students, they'll be able to work in groups, they'll be able to share materials and work together in, in cooperative spaces as they always have. Middle school is a spot where we, have, we, have, we are predicting, as we are staging, some of those um, science labs, for example, where we might have larger classes and we might want to be able to be hands-on with materials. There could be a moment where we might be within three feet for, for some of those instructional periods. And as I said, if that were the case, we would, we would incorporate seating charts. We would make sure that we were notifying families. And also, at middle school, our students have had the opportunity to be vaccinated. We certainly know that not all are, but it would also minimize the close contact in that sense as well. Thinking about what three feet looks like in a middle school, the, the, ex the kind of bookend pictures there are the more typical middle school desks that we have had for many, many years, kind of spaced out in rows. But again, you can see that spacing is not really atypical spacing to a typical year. The middle picture is an example of kind of utilizing every possible piece of furniture that we have in district to maintain six feet. The tables are four foot tables. And so the mathematicians among us will, will understand the complications of trying to create three foot distancing with a series of four foot tables and maintaining walking aisles. So you're seeing a combination of desks and tables and some next to each other to ensure that we can fit our largest classes in each classroom while maintaining that six foot instruct, or excuse me, that three foot instructional distance. Middle school lunch will generally operate as we had pre-pandemic using the lunch tables um, in the middle schools with somewhere between five and seven students seated at that table depending on uh, the, the, the lunch period and the building. We do want to ensure that we are offering that option for families who might prefer a more distanced eating option at the middle school. And this really has less to do with any individual student's vaccination status and more to do with the family's comfort level. So we're offering it regardless to any, any family who would prefer that for their students. We, we asked for an initial sort of interest survey on that and we have the, you know, the results of that, but certainly that wasn't all of our families. So the actual commitment to, yes, I am comfortable at a lunch table or no, I would prefer a greater distance will be something that we'll be asking specifically of middle school families in the, the coming days. Obviously we are getting close to that. That coincides with kind of mapping out that, that the, the seating options that would be available. So families do understand exactly what they are opting into or out of in terms of lunch seating. And we will have the cafeteria line available at the middle schools as we have in the past. However, there is some variance to that as well. And so I wanted, we've gotten a number of questions about lunch. And so I wanted to take a minute to try to clarify some of those questions. So last year, there was an emergency provision approved by USDA that allowed us to provide food to, to, to any family who would ask for it. And the way that has transferred this year with a slight change in the way the USDA is handling it, I mean, it continues to be that any student may receive a lunch and or a snack paid by federal funds, but it also extends to the idea that that is the exclusive way that the middle school cafeterias will operate. In other words, 
food is available to any student who wants it, but no one can pay for it at this point in time at the middle schools, which seems like an interesting shift, but that's, the, that's aligned with the way the USDA has developed this program. And so we will have a, a, a hot lunch option at the middle schools, um, and we will have the option to, to take, you know, sort of three sides and a milk, but it will, it, will only, it will only be that free of charge option. And so again, we're trying to continue to clarify that. We will be buffering the order at the beginning of the year, so we certainly won't see any students hungry. Um, and we'll have other points to, to survey families to opt in or out of that scenario. And again, thinking of mass breaks at the middle school, whenever possible, that'll be PE outside. And similarly, teachers will be encouraged to, when a lesson or an activity is conducive, to utilize the outdoor spaces in at, at our middle school campuses and take their classes outside to have a mass break. That may be for the bulk of a class. It may be for 10 minutes worth of a class, depending on which educational activity best aligns with going outside for that mass break. We also are excited to see the, the activities and athletics resume across our school district. We are gonna phase this in a little bit. Obviously, any activity in any sport is gonna be subject, like everything else in our educational plan, to whatever the most current guidance is. And masking requirements may differ by indoor and outdoor sports, and also by age level. We're starting this off with our school and district sponsored activities, so our middle school sports and our school sponsored clubs and activities. We intend as, as quickly as reasonably possible to broaden this to PTA sponsored clubs and activities and even outside organizations. We want all of this for our students. We also wanna recognize our institutional capacity and we wanna prioritize our academic in-person instruction and then rolling into district sponsored activities and then continuing to broaden. So now we move on to that uh, student part of the day after students leave, uh, kind of what's happening in our buildings. So um, one of them is that our uh, district's building and grounds uh, crew will continue to support regular cleaning and disinfection of surfaces throughout the day. Um, however, the vast majority of the disinfection process will, will take place during the evening hours. Um, our protocols actually are very similar to what they were previously with some uh, minor changes in the required chemicals and uh, methods available to staff to accomplish this. Uh, an additional uh, recommended CDC mitigation strategy that we wanted to speak to was the optional free weekly PCR screening. Um, as a district, uh, we, we have uh, we want to offer to families who have provided written consent uh, the ability to have their child participate in a weekly PCR test. Uh, the one that we uh, have selected is a, a nasal swab, um, which uh, is a, in, a, a cotton swab that's inserted into the nasal cavity about a half inch um, and, then, and then kind of circled around uh, both sides of the nostril. Uh, we did investigate uh, SHIELD uh, as, a, as a PCR option. That is um, the agency that's partnering with uh, ISBE. Uh, but we, we chose to move away from that because they did require that uh, students not eat or drink at least an hour uh, prior to doing um, their specimen collection, which is a, a drool, uh, drooling into a tube. Uh, and it is our goal to really uh, make this a part of the start of the day, and so we didn't want to worry about having to have students come in and then wait uh, before the specimen was collected. So um, this, this mitigation strategy uh, is, is an optional one, and it won't be available, or we're not anticipating anti getting it started uh, right at the start of the school year. We do want our students and staff to kind of settle back into those protocol routines that they did so well at the end of last school year, and then uh, we'll be layering in this, this mitigation strategy for those that are interested. Uh, the screening will occur at, at the student's school of attendance, and just uh, we'll, we'll be looking to just kind of make it a natural part of the routine that they're going through for those that are interested. Uh, results are provided within 24 hours, uh, both to the district and to the parent. Um, and really the goal of this particular mitigation strategy is to identify asymptoma asymptomatic individuals uh, prior to them uh, spreading the virus unintentionally. Um, related to quarantine, uh, the biggest change here is that uh, we, we learned through last year that we don't need those large quarantine spaces that we were, we were withholding from instructional use uh, for fear of having large groups come through. 
um, with some of the changes to um, the, the need no longer to evacuate entire classrooms when a student is symptomatic, but rather being able to come in and do cleaning at the spot that the student was sitting. Mm -hmm. uh, we just, we don't anticipate a need for a larger space. So in our buildings, we'll be using the nurse's office as our primary quarantine space. And then as we do um, in all instances, you know, the principal will have a backup plan. If by chance we do see an outbreak or something unexpected, there'll be a plan to move to a larger space, but um, we're not going to hold a spot uh, to do that. Um, instead, we'll be using all of our, our spaces instructionally, so. In the event that a student does find themselves under a mandatory COVID-related quarantine, we do want to continue to maintain that learning connection for the student while they are unable to attend. And so what we are calling this during this school year is a home learning connection because it is different than the remote learning, the various remote learning scenarios we saw last year. So in, in a new school year, we're going to give it a new name. And, and really, the obligation is to make sure that we maintain that connection to instruction, that continuity of instruction. But the reality is we don't have that remote option where students could simply just join a remote section. We don't have teachers assigned to teach remotely in that way. So that connection will be accomplished through a combination of strategies that are gonna vary by age and grade level and, and really individual circumstances that teachers will work through. The goal here is to provide our teaching staff with the flexibility to work with families and create a system that is instructionally beneficial and, and, and mutually compatible. And so it may, it may consist of some video conferencing where a teacher would, would meet up directly with a student or a small group of students. It may be some form of concurrent instruction, which is where the student would Zoom or video conference into the classroom for a period of time. It, it, would, it would likely almost never be the entire day, but it would be identifying some of those instructional moments where that would be maximized. And again, that's gonna look different for a first grader than it might for a sixth grader. We use Seesaw and Google Classroom, and there could also certainly be print materials shared between teacher and student uh, to use as part of this time. So again, this will be a, a flexible system that'll be developed individually. Um, the, the one thing we will commit to for sure is there will be that daily live synchronous connection between the teacher and student during quarantine. So while uh, as a district we remain very interested in uh, implementing a test to stay program uh, which would uh, it would allow students uh, who are close contacts to have the option to uh, do testing uh, every other day and if those tests were negative to uh, continue to participate in on-site schooling. Um, at this point, the local health department is not in support of that as an option. Uh, while we believe that our safety systems uh, really will reduce the risk of close contacts in schools, we recognize that uh, for our families uh, of students who have to take the bus, that really that's an unavoidable uh, part of that system. And we see that there could be real, really some benefit, particularly for that part of our population. Mm -hmm. So uh, we'll be prepared to implement a test to stay option. Um, that will be via our, um, our partnership with uh, North Shore Clinical Laboratories. Uh, but at this point, it's not one that we're able to uh, implement. So that brings us to the end of our uh, presentation. Just a few closing comments. The guidance calls for layered mitigations that can be adjusted in consultation with the health department and the IDPH depending on the transmission rates, you know, low, moderate, um, high, various rates. Um, we're really looking forward to seeing our students in school five days a week. It feels very good to be starting knowing that um, school will look very similarly to it had or in the manner that it did prior to the pandemic. I want to encourage everyone in the community to, to focus on the positives. COVID has impacted us in many different ways and there are many reasons not to focus on the positives, but where we were a year ago to where we are today is um, very significant. And um, as you can see from the presentation, a lot of the guidance has loosened up significantly so school can look the way we're all accustomed to it looking. And we've come a long way together and I would just continue to encourage our community to stick together with this. And um, again, we've done very well as a school district throughout the pandemic. I wanna continue that. 
and I want to thank our team for all their hard work uh, putting all this together. Uh, this guidance is really uh, less than two weeks old, and so uh, a lot of quick turnaround, especially during the start of the school year, which is always a hectic time. So thank you to the entire district office team, our teachers, our support staff, uh, the Board of Education. Uh, it's just been a lot uh, to, to go through, but i um, very proud of the work that our team has accomplished, so thank you. With that, if there are any uh, questions from the Board of Education, and just a reminder to the public, the full plan itself is attached to board docs. It will also be attached to the website after the meeting, but you can find the entire plan, which is a very similar format to what we had last year. Uh, this year's plan, though, is obviously significantly shorter because there aren't as many uh, health and safety requirements as there were last year. Okay, I'll yeah. start. Go ahead, Tracy. Um, thank you so much, Justin, Jessica, Kevin, for um, kind of walking us through as a mom and uh, as parents up here we we I personally like seeing how the day is gonna go um, I like knowing the nitty-gritty of, of how it goes so that flushing that out was helpful um, as far as the middle school and lockers um, last year granted there was no passing periods now that passing periods are back with the bringing lockers back into the fold are backpacks still going to be allowed um, Yes. In, during passing periods? Mm -hmm. Yes, because the reality is that if we're trying to stagger locker use, not every student would be able to use their locker every passing period. So we'll be talking through, and again, some of, the, some of these are the details that we want to wait until staff come back on Monday and Tuesday to have some conversations. They are often um, quicker to come up with solutions than we are as they're in the hallway for every passing period and seeing what's happening. So. Okay, and granted, I, I don't have an elementary school kid anymore, but just like some food for thought. Um, as far as last year with uh, carrying a backpack and not having lockers, obviously that will sort of be mitigated a little bit. But um, I know for my son and many of his friends, like walking to school wasn't really an option because there was practically the weight of a dead body in their backpack. Mm -hmm. um, so I was driving him because I, he didn't ride the bus. So same goes for elementary school. I'm asking, are the kids allowed to leave stuff in their desk like pre-pandemic times so that they only have to take their backpack and maybe their lunch pack home? Yes. So ki kids can, elementary kids can leave their supplies yep. at school Absolutely. in students, their desk. Students will just be, like it used to be. Correct. Yes. Students will be assigned Yay. a desk. One of the, one, <laughs> honestly, one of the, the concerns was really well intentioned with the cleaning and, and the misting and all of those things. Yeah. There was genuine concern about not only when we had AM and PM students, but we didn't want materials to be ruined by, by the, the methods we had to take. And so as we've lived through this, we've learned that that likely isn't going to be the case. You know, if a piece of paper is left on top of a desk overnight, that could be problematic. But in terms of leaving books and pencil cases and things, that's all going to be just fine. Okay. And then... And Tracy, um, just one more uh, yeah. to jump in. With middle school, we are changing for PE. We're going to give it a couple weeks because our current 8th grade students, never, some of them never had the opportunity to actually purchase a PE uniform. And so we want to make sure that everybody has the chance to make that purchase. So for the first couple weeks of PE, the kids will still be going to physical education. We'll be doing appropriate activities based on the dress of the kids. And then the way we'll assign lockers, we work with the middle school principals, you know, we will spread out the students and provide that six feet inside of the locker room when they're changing. So when we assign those lockers, you know, first period will, will be over here. And then, you know, you kind of go through the alphabet and make sure then you separate second period and that. So everybody will be staggered according to their lockers and the PE teachers will work with our students on that. It'll be a lot more strategic rather than that's the one I want. Yeah, it, it, it always is uh, strategic, but certainly this year it's going to be much more strategic to make sure that our kids have social distancing when they're changing for PE. But uh, again, when we say we want it to be back to normal, that's a perfect example of that. But we also want to provide that buffer for people to be able to order their uh, physical education uniforms if they haven't had the chance to do that yet. Super. And then the only other question I had, and you <coughs> sort of spelled it out, Justin, in about school lunches, but this week I had some questions about the school lunches, specifically at the uh at the middle school um so if you don't is is it like monthly you could sign up for the free lunch or can you change your mind and, and sign up later like how how will that work do you have to start from the get-go to no. say I want the free lunch? Nope, you can. You, there will be there will be points to opt in. I don't want to commit right now to saying it will be monthly or what the interval will be, but certainly there will be various points throughout the year to, to for a family to change the decision for their student. Okay, so just to be make sure, because this was also something that was out in the ether, uh, it, it's not an it's no longer an a la carte option where somebody can have a cookie and go back to their table. Like it's the it's the pre 
bagged hot warm lunch or whatever that is so the, the the options are a main entree and a, a, a couple of sides or you can come up and take just the three sides which would be similar to an a la carte however i'm not I'm not guessing cookie. I'm guessing raisins and, <laughs> and carrots and things like that. <laughs> right. There won't be the, what we had two years ago. The there, there will not. Right. There will not be the ice cream bars or the cookies or things like that to purchase a la carte. Nothing will be available for purchase. And we'll see that for the record, we're, we're, we're all pro cookie here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No one's against cookies. I yeah. promise you that. <laughs> um, one of the things I want to make clear: these are not District 58 rules. This is the National School Lunch Program, and so for us to be able to provide. Um, assistance to families in need during this time. If you take the assistance, you also have to take the rules. I do get questions about District 99. District 99 has opted out of the National School Lunch Program, um, and so that is why they may not be bound by the same rules that we are right now in terms of, so if you have a child with a high school, it may not be the same rules as the elementary district because we are in the National School Lunch Program to get that assistance. Okay, and this, not to get too deep in the weeds, but it's too late. Um, <laughs> there another question was about milk. Um, it, like, there's kids that brought their own lunches and wanted milk. So under this, under this new, what did you call it, food, SLA or National whatever? National School Lunch yeah, Program. Yeah, under that program, they're getting the lunch. It's not, they, they're not getting, we can't just go and walk up to get milk. Todd, do you want to jump in? <coughs> Sorry, I just want to make sure because that's no. also out in the community and so I want everyone to know right. about that. Yes, and the rules have changed several times. I mean, this is the new rules that we're working on for this year. Um, they can get a milk. They pick the snack slash breakfast um, option, snack option, and that uh, a milk comes with that option as well as some type of snack, an apple or a, a you know, granola bar or something like that, whatever they've you know, put together that fits the requirements of that snack provision under the federal guidelines. Super, thank you. And guys. then they can get a milk. Thank you. I just want to make sure yep. everyone heard that as well. Thank you. Thank you. And we will again, um, our building principals are going to be sending out newsletters with, with this information as well. Um, the reason this hasn't been, we wanted to discuss it here at the board level first, and then just like they do every year prior to the start of the year, this weekend's newsletter will have a lot of this information in there. And then the only other thing, and this is totally more commentary than a question, is I, I really am very excited to see the slide about clubs and activities returning, because in my opinion, this fall, those things are going to be instrumental to getting our kids more acclimated to school. I'm sure they're going to love seeing their teacher, but all the extracurricular activities and sports. So, you know, for all the things that might not look this, you know, with the mask, all these other things are coming back, and that's so awesome. Mm -hmm. So I am celebrating the fact that drama club or cross country or all those things at middle school that my son didn't even get to all the middle school kids didn't have last year they're having that opportunity and i think that's a totally big reason to celebrate right now and so i know that i know the focus is getting the kids back in the building but even at the elementary level i really hope that all the staff and everyone is trying to figure out how to come up with these fun activities outside of school so thank you thank you I'll, uh, I'll take the next shot. Um, question on, no, first, uh, I guess I'll name, the, the work in this is amazing. Uh, the, the amount of guidance that I was reading through, uh, and I was able to just scan and then trust that the administration was going to go through with the fine tooth comb, just really appreciate the work there. Um, snacks in elementary, mm -hmm. I, will it happen every day, or will it happen most days? How, where are we going, and when will that be finalized? It'll, it will be finalized once we have final setups and, and, and final class sizes and we can really lay out each classroom and determine what that looks like. So, you know, in a class of, of 18 or 19, you know, we accomplished 18 or 19 students at six feet last year. So in theory, you could spread out that particular individual class and make it happen in a classroom. A class of 27, you won't be able to accomplish that within that one classroom. So then the question becomes, what are our 
alternatives. Um, and that's exactly, again, what we are going to, to talk, have our, our teachers and our, our building administrators working through during the opening days and in that times in their building to try to come up with it. So the reason I don't want to say it will happen every day is because I, I can't guarantee that yet based on the physical capacity mm -hmm. of each building and the ability for a teacher to supervise that time as well. You know, you could, in theory, you could put half of your students in the hallway and stretch them down, but then can I really see them and is that a valuable use of time? You know, the outside option is available and it doesn't rain all day on most days, so it could be that the snack maybe occurs in the afternoon occasionally and we allow for that flexibility. But those are the kinds of conversations that will be happening at the building level next week. But our goal is certainly to piggyback on what Justin said, to have that daily snack, especially for our primary students. Um, it's a long time for five, six, and seven-year-olds to make it through. Uh, the other point that I want to continue to make, whether we're talking about masks or snacks, or there are medical exemptions. And so anyone listening, if their child has a unique need, for, for instance, if they have to eat when they have medication, no matter what, that child's need will be met, um, typically per their 504 plan, uh, but we will obviously work with any medical need. And if there's a rainy day where we can't get outside and have snack, a child who absolutely has to have it because of a medical condition will, will always make sure that that happens. Sure that, uh, should, should families expect to hear from the building level, the teacher level, or as a district will make a I'm guessing it's either building or classroom. Yeah, and it is, and it will be a combination. I think in some case, you know, it will it will be building level communication, and then once we get into the routine of school, uh, you know, families will expect to hear from teachers about some of those daily routines as well, just as they, just as they would in a typical year, you know, leading up to a curriculum night conversation. I think this may have already come out, so forgive me. When we talk about weekly screening mm -hmm. uh, and opt-ins for that, is this something that's already available for families to do? Or will that come out again if it's not, or when will it be coming? Yeah, we are um, expecting to be sending out consents at the start of the school year, but actually not implementing until um, at least till after Labor Day. We want to just get get the year up and running, and then we can kind of layer that in. So, by a homeschool folder or through like an email, how will parents be getting that? Probably a combination, okay. I would think, um, just to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to um, view the consent and determine if it's appropriate for them. Thank yeah. you. And it will it will come from a, a, a district communication first, but then the principals will repeat that in their uh, newsletters, because we want to have that one consistent form throughout our school district. I do want to make a couple of comments about some of the um, questions that I've been receiving over email and then over the phone about testing. We did not do testing last year um, for the simple fact that our district couldn't afford it. Uh, we were estimating that it would have cost about $75,000 a week to be able to do that and that is just something that we wouldn't be able to do this year testing is free um, either from the state or a federal uh, group uh, so for instance North Shore gets uh, subsidized by the federal government and that's why we're able to do that we are not mandating screening testing and we are not mandating symptomatic testing throughout the school year last year we saw several families struggle with being able to go out and get a test and turn it around very quickly. So this is a service that we're offering to our families because it's now free for the school district, but it is not mandatory. I have received several, uh, you know, phone calls or emails, you know, saying, who are you to force my kid to get a test? We are not forcing any child to get a test. We are not forcing any child to go into uh, screening. So I just want to make that clear. Uh, while we're talking about testing, uh We'll, we will make the weekly screening optional and so that parent, families can opt in too. Mm -hmm. The test to stay is currently not being made available. Correct. Speak, could you speak to the bottleneck on why that's not available? Because once a kid is sent home for quarantine, like that's the next thing that a family has to go and chase is I need to get them tested uh, and figure out whether they are positive or negative. So I'm wondering what the bottleneck there is. Yeah, so the bottleneck is the local health department. Um, DuPage County Health Department, unlike uh, the vast majority of health departments, um, is not allowing this. Uh, when it comes to quarantine and determining close contacts, that does fall under the purview of the local health department. Um, we have um, shared with the health department, not only as a district, but as a, a, a county, that we would uh, like them to uh, reconsider that, especially because of busing. 
Um, our kids are masked. Our kids are, you know, for the most part, when they're in school, socially distanced. We think that this is a very viable option that our health department um, should get behind. And so we are asking them to review that. And uh, they have shared that they're going to continue their talks with IDPH and other health departments. So that is really the roadblock behind test to stay. Um, and just to be clear, what we're talking about with test to stay, if you were deemed a close contact at school, um, if you were deemed a close contact outside of school in a maskless situation, you wouldn't be eligible for test to stay. This would be like if Darren and I were on the bus and we were sitting in the same seat, we were wearing our masks, we were doing what we were supposed to, then we would be eligible for test to stay if the county approved it. So the very first test, you, you have to wait for the results, but if it's negative, you're allowed to come back to school. You would then be tested on day three, day five, and day seven. If that is not an option, there is an early quarantine option that the health department is still allowing us to exercise that we had in place last year. And uh, that is you can come back on day 10 if you have a negative PCR test on the seventh day, eighth day, ninth day, or 10th day, you are able to come back to school at that particular point. Uh, so that is still an option and that is something that um, a parent could take advantage of at the school so they wouldn't have to you know, go to CVS or their oh, local doctor or any of those things. Um, just to, I just yeah. want to clarify some. So we, I know that we can't test to stay in, in DuPage County, mm -hmm. and I know even if we offer that at some point, that will be completely disconnected from the people that want to do the screening. Mm -hmm. So if, if if I'm not doing screening, but I now my kids are close contact, I want to test that. So even though we can't do that, can we just through the school? test to find out we know we are close contact can we utilize that service through the school just to go I know I have to quarantine anyway but can we do the test or would that be something that's not done through this program does that make sense can we get tested anyway even though you can't use it to stay um, just to kind of do so that we, first test for parents or would they then be required to do that on their own so for a student that is at school and becomes symptomatic if we've got consent to give the PCR we're able to give the PCR before we send you home so then you don't even have to make that second trip to the doctor's office a courier comes from North Shore they take the specimen to the lab and then we get yeah. the results within 24 hours um, but we wouldn't and I'm not sure if this is what you're saying Darren but we wouldn't be able to have the child go home and then at some point come back to get that PCR like once you leave us you need until we have results you're not able to come back Can, I think Mask what I'm it. asking is is there an opportunity for single opportunity consent you know where a, a parent can call in and say I'm on my way go ahead and, and test them I'm picking yeah, all them up the right consents now. are managed at the local level so it's the school that really is is the knows who is able to participate and who is not so it is us that's that's connecting North Shore with the child at school so um yes you are able to do single consent it just it needs to be written consent so that sure. is something for us to to just be aware of how you intend for us to use that okay sorry Continue. Well, that makes sense. Thanks for that. Um, last question around quarantine lengths. Mm -hmm. Last year we had everything from 10 days to 14 days mm -hmm. to sometimes it was seven or waiting for a close context test result and quarantine right. until you find that out. So mm -hmm. has any of that changed or quarantine is very similar to what we saw last year? Yeah, so quarantine is the exact same as what we were seeing last year. The only difference really is um, the definition of a close contact for students has changed. Now you can sit three feet. It's Last year it was six feet. But all those same things apply. Our local health department does not endorse and will not allow the seven day uh, early out uh, for quarantine. They do allow the 10 and the 14 so long as you meet the appropriate criteria. Thanks. Are other counties doing the seven? Uh, other counties are doing the seven, and um, but predominantly in the collar counties, it, it, it's the 10 day. I will, though, say with a caveat, I am hyper focused in on DuPage County right now, so I, I, if there's a change in Lake or Will, I, I just may not be aware of it at this time. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. But that is an interesting question because I, we have many educators in our district who, um, either themselves or perhaps their spouse, may work in a different county. And I will get questions about how come this school district does it this way and why aren't you doing it that way? A lot of it has to do with the local health department. Um, I will say DuPage County is extremely um, conservative in terms of you know, not loosening up things where Cook has been shown to be a little bit more loose with some of the things. Other comments, questions? One question on middle school passing periods. I know you know we've heard just anecdotal stories here and there over the course of the years about the crowds in the middle schools during passing periods. And I know you mentioned something about potentially staggering, or, or how are we going to try to 
eliminate that as much as possible um, in terms of the passing needs for middle schools and crowdings in the hallways and things like that. Sure. So again, one piece is thinking about when locker use is available for students so that we don't, you know, that, that's one thing that clogs a hallway. Another is traffic patterns. If you could think back to last year, we saw a lot of taped arrows and things like that. So those are considerations. You know, at Herrick, they at, at, at different times have implemented up and down stairwells just to kind of keep traffic moving in that way. It, re it really is about getting from place to place. And again, without the locker stops and things like that, in encouraging kids to, to make their way to the next class, right? The, the passing period won't necessarily be the social time that that it may have been a couple of years ago because we just want to keep we, the, the goal is to get to our next class right. okay. no that, lolly gagging around <laughs> <laughs> and that is certainly more of an issue at Herrick than it would be at O'Neill simply yeah. just because of the number of um, students in the building but the backpacks go a long way with that it, it reduces that the other thing too is in order to be a close contact it's 15 minutes and so when kids are passing each other in passing periods there's just not a lot of data that shows that that's been a problem for especially our larger high schools and again um, with universal masking mm -hmm. that does help a lot uh, in terms of those close contacts yeah I'll just make one comment I, I like that third bullet there about focusing on the positives I guess you know I'm usually a guy that's kind of a half full kind of glass um, and I appreciate that, but <laughs> I think I think we should celebrate the fact that we're going to resemble pre-pandemic instruction. I, I think you know we kind of get caught up in the weeds on certain topics, but the fact that you know I'm going to be able to take my two kids to school without a mask, drop them off, they're going to have a great um, instructional uh, experience throughout the day, and then I'll be able to pick them up without a mask. I mean, I, if you kind of look at that, how things have changed over that 17 months, I think we we should be celebrating this. And you took the words right out of my mouth, Steve. Um, Kevin, you said two things that resonated with me, one at the end, one at the beginning, and the end one was well, let's make sure we're looking at the positive here. Um, the first one you said at the beginning that also resonated me, uh, with me was um, just like a, a frustration out of, um, from a lack of local control over this issue. And uh, I'm particularly frustrated about, now is, it, is DuPage County the only county still that, or have, that does not allow tests to stay out of all of the counties in Illinois? To my knowledge, and we have, um, as a group of superintendents, asked the uh, director of the Illinois so Association of School Administrators to research this. To my knowledge, DuPage County is the only county that is not allowing tests to stay. Again, there are a lot of there's a lot of counties in Illinois, but to my knowledge, DuPage County is the only one who is not allowing that at this time. Okay, thank you. Um, so, I guess on the topic of local control, we thought we had that. Um, we don't. Um, because of the governor's mandate, it looked very similar to last summer when we thought we had a say in, in opening our schools and that was kind of yanked out from us at the last minute. So kind of in your head, Kevin, talk to me about how you see this playing out when that edict disappears. Um, when the governor says that we are um, re removing the mask mandate for, um, for K-12 education, would you, it, what, what are your next steps? Are we, are we, are we going to be, is that, tr is that starting like a, 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 a several week period of analysis? Are we going to have a board meeting to discuss this? Uh, is this going to be like just flipping a light switch? Um, I guess a lot of people are eager to know what happens next, even though that might be not on the horizon. It might be a long time from now, but where is, how does, how do, you know, there's people in our community who want, um, sure. who are thinking about, or, you know, We've, we've seen it at lots of board meetings about you know the mask issue so I guess when that what's where's that going next I guess n nowhere soon I know but like what's the next step in that in that uh, dilemma I guess so I can tell you what I'm what I'm hearing by no means does this mean that this is actually going to play out from a state level um, I think the mask mandate from what I'm hearing um, is going to be around for a while uh, there are pretty significant rumors that that will be in place um, until you see um, every school age child um, have the ability to be vaccinated. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not saying that that is going to happen, uh, but that is what I am certainly hearing. Um, the next thing, one of the things that we have indicated um, as a school district prior to a lot of these changes is um, we are not in a position as a local school district to mandate anyone to be vaccinated. Uh, that is certainly a, a family decision. Um, in terms of when vaccines are mandated for school, that comes from the Illinois Department of Public Health. Uh, there are all sorts of rumors out there in terms of you know when, when it gets fully authorized, whether or not that that will become mandatory. Um, I think that could be likely, uh, not from a school district perspective, but from a state perspective. But again, that will come from the IDPH. 
Certainly, I think the game changes when everyone does have the ability to be vaccinated um, because everyone has now had the option and whether or not you've selected that option. So for instance, when all of our middle school students had that option, we had indicated that we would be more than comfortable being mask optional because everyone had that choice. And so that would continue to be my recommendation as we move forward unless we have um, significant uh, changes from the CDC or the local health department in, in, in those types of things. So that's kind of what we're looking at as a school district. Um, I have had calls to be proactive and say, you know, you need to tell us right now what you're going to do. I have to be very candid. This pandemic continues to be fluid and, and continues to change. And um, we've been proactive throughout this whole time. And what we've seen is the rug can get pulled out from you at any given moment. So that is what we're prepping for. That is kind of what we're looking at. Um, but again, we're hearing all sorts of rumors one way or the other. Um, but I do think it is that when everyone has that option, I think it changes significantly for all school districts in, in Illinois. Okay. When we saw that change kind of, not last minute, not as last minute as it felt last year, but I mean, what was, was it the day or the day after that you sent out the email saying it, it looks like mask optional for middle school and for staff? It was an hour later. Was it? Yeah, we were, yeah, yeah I was, it was on an vacation. hour later yeah. on a Tuesday. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, I mean, th every time we, we get comfortable thinking, we have an idea of, of the step that we can take. It, it seems like uh, everything changes on us. So. Mm -hmm. uh, I appreciate your willingness to, you know, to pivot and get this done because that wasn't that many weeks ago that I, I think we all had a, a slightly different vision for the for the start of the school year um, and I certainly appreciate the extent which with, with which we're trying to get to normalcy yeah the one thing I would you know continue to ask the community on, on all sides of this argument I get articles shared with me I have people tell me I need to follow the science both sides are telling me I need to, to follow the right. science I am not an epidemiologist I am not a virologist I am a school superintendent who's trained in education. I, I just have to be very, very clear. Where I turn to is the CDC, the Illinois Department of Public Health, and the DuPage County Health Department. Um, someone jokingly said, you know, the, the superintendent must be crazy. He's listening to the Illinois Department of Public Health, the DuPage County uh, Health Department, and the American Academy of Pediatrics. Well, what's wrong with this guy? In, in, you know, that is exactly what I'm doing because I am not trained to do that. That is what they are trained to do. Their whole purview is making sure that they stop the spread of, of diseases spreading in the community. So that is what I will continue to do. I will continue to seek their advisement. Um, and that is the objective criteria that I have to use as a public school superintendent. And, and so I will continue to do that. Um, when we have options presented to us, just like we had last year in terms of should you be remote or should you be in person, I am always an advocate of having kids in school when parents can't have choice to give parents choices. Um, you know, I, I, I believe in that, but I also have concerns when one person's choice can impact another. And so we, we have to take everything into consideration, but we will continue to do that and we will demonstrate that or, or we have demonstrated that throughout this pandemic. Any other questions or comments at this time? Thank you guys Thank very you. much. Thank you. <coughs> All right, we're at that time. This is an opportunity for members of the audience to share public comment with the board, but is not intended to be a time for members of the audience to enter into a public dial uh, into a into a dialogue with the board issues raised during tonight's public comment may be added to future agendas or addressed by administrative staff as appropriate uh, please remember that criticism of individuals is not in order uh, see, I, I think I currently have seven cards uh, last call for cards is there anyone else that would like to make a, a comment tonight I have allotted 30 minutes for public comment. We ask that you keep your comment to a three minute limit to allow everyone the opportunity to speak. Uh, so uh, once I've called your name, if you wouldn't mind stepping up to the podium and, uh, and then uh, stating your attendance area and making your comment. I have Sarah Rusin uh, from the Highland area. Hello. Hi. My name is Sarah Rusan. I'm a mom of an incoming first grader. Very excited. Um, many of you know me from your inbox. A couple of you know me from uh, previous meetings before I realized these were recorded. So I came prepared this time. Um, before the mask mandate was issued, I wrote to uh, Governor Pritzker and Dr. Zike, 
And I'd like to share a portion of that letter with you all tonight. A little nervous, sorry. Um, I do not have the knowledge to know what actions can be done to regain control and revoke local authority. I do know the soul crushing pain of loss. I do know that nearly seven years ago we were heartbroken after facing four miscarriages and years of infertility treatments. I do know that nearly seven years ago a woman made the difficult choice to place her child for adoption so that she would be cared for, loved, and protected. I also know that I'm not alone in the endless love and fierce protectiveness a parent has for their child. My voice is a drop in the ocean of parents who are scared, anxious, and feeling helpless as we enter this next school year as more and more districts approve mask optional policies. I tell my daughter that my number one job as her mom is to keep her safe, and I don't know how to do that without your help. That help was provided, and through Governor Pritzker's executive order and the integrity and courage of this board, you've helped me keep my daughter safe. Thousands of parents in our district were relieved when this executive order came through. I know the challenges you all face are, for, are far from over. Across the country, we are seeing tensions bubble over in board meetings and at our schools. And we are once again faced with the uncertainty and anxiety of what our children may face as they go to school this year. The goal of this year is to provide as close to normal of an experience for our children. I'm asking our community to channel the same resiliency and grit we championed in our kids last year, to insulate and raise up our neighborhood schools and teachers for the sake of our children and in support of this common goal. The decisions have already been made. Let us not forget that we are all still in this together. And one final sentiment, red for Ed always. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Marshall Schmidt, Pierce Dunham. Welcome back. <laughs> well, I, uh, I hate to be off topic, but it's a topic you're familiar with uh, when it comes to me. Marshall Schmidt, Pierce Downer. Um, at the last board meeting, the board voted to put Longfellow up for bid and enter into a seven-year lease for approximately 5,400 square feet of space to house the administrative staff. The next night, the village council renewed, reviewed ongoing negotiations with the district to enter into a 50-year lease to house the administrative staff. Such space is expected to become available in approximately two to three years. At no time, however, has the board discussed the impact of these negotiations on the sale of Longfellow. Inexplicably, no financial analysis was done by the district as to what it would cost to minimally maintain Longfellow until the new facilities are ready. No such financial analysis has been presented to the Financial Advisory Committee since the village opportunity again became viable. These omissions are especially telling given that the LEO analysis of the short-term Longfellow option showed that the district would lose at least $300,000 renting new space instead of using Longfellow. <clears throat> In public comments, the community noted the discrepancy. It is also telling because during the prior administration, the short-term use of Longfellow until space in Village Hall became available was high on the list of alternative resolutions of the Longfellow issue. The board seemed comfortable or content with using Longfellow as a bridge to a permanent solution. What happened? The board owes the community an explanation. Multiple board members have gone on at great length about how the desperate need for cash to fix roofs is driving the sale of Longfellow. Yet when a solution is available that will pay for roofs, the solution is not considered or even analyzed. Instead, the board and the administration are in a mad rush to sell Longfellow. When the bidding process failed to yield what the board thought the land was worth, instead of considering the short-term Longfellow option, the administration and the board dropped the price over 20%, $800,000, in, in an unexplained drive to dump the property and pay $150,000 a year to a third-party landlord. The board and the administration did so without even disclosing how far negotiations with the village had advanced. Why? What's the rush? Why does the district have to sell now when Longfellow has almost three times the space the board claims it needs for its staff? Why are the administration and the board pursuing a path that squanders large sums of money that could help a student avoid of having to observe buckets in the hallway of their school? 
liquidating Longfellow in two to three years will satisfy those who believe that the real value in the district lies, in, or the real value of Longfellow to the district lies in its value as residential real estate, while saving money today that will go to a landlord's taxes and profit if the district continues on its current path. Without any explanation as to the board's failure to consider a short-term Longfellow option, we, the community, in the community, are entitled to know: Is the board being negligent in considering its available options? Or is there something else that's compelling the administration to advocate for disposing of Longfellow before an alternative more beneficial to the children is even considered? Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, Jim Hamilton, Pierce Downer. Welcome. Hello, everybody. My name is Jim Hamilton. I have two children who will attend Pierce Downer this year. I'm an active member of our community, volunteering my time as a coach for multiple youth sports through the Park District over the last several years. I care a great deal about the safety and well-being of the kids in our community. And I want to thank the board administration for their service in trying to make this school year as normal as possible. Uh, but I do have some concerns about the current masking policy. Although I recognize and respect that there are very different opinions on this matter, I feel strongly that parents should be able to decide if their child wears a mask at school. Last year, my family was, felt forced into disenrolling from District 58 because of the shift to full remote learning it was not feasible for us, and we could not facilitate it on such a short notice. And more importantly, it would have been detrimental to the learning and psychological needs of my first and second grade child. As a result, my children successfully attended full in-person learning every single day last year with zero outbreaks or quarantines. To be clear, these, ent these same entities that forced the remote and hybrid learning models which kept their kids out of the classroom full time for the most of last year were wrong then. And they're wrong today to mandate universal masking. Continuing to force all children to wear masks seven hours a day, five days a week, for months and years on end will have long-term detrimental impacts on their social emotional development and learning progress. Children need to see expressions of emotion and visual pronunciation. They need to be focused on listening, learning, and engaging in an environment around them. They should not be inhibited or distracted from these imperative skills, nor should they be pressured into developing the concerning compulsive behaviors that these practices are instilling on them. After 17 months of a pandemic and approaching our third impacted school year, it is inexcusable that the, our institutions have not haven't researched or provided clear data as illustrating whether mask use in elementary school settings reduces transmission of COVID-19 in any notable way. I understand you feel your hands are tied by the governor's mandate. I have and will continue to reach out to the governor, legislature, and health agencies to force my concerns, but I need to understand from you that these efforts are not for nothing. Well, while we as parents press our government, what are you doing to drive change? Will you unite with the other districts in the state to demand clarity on when these mandates will end? And once the mandate is lifted one way or another, will you commit to providing parents with the opportunity to decide what's best for their own children? Please, at a minimum, commit tonight to parent choice on masking once the mandate is removed and bring clarity now to what the future will hold for the children in our district that we as parents on both ends of the spectrum can plan accordingly. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Josh Hearn, maybe, or Hearn. Hello. Um, I'll admit that when I came in and filled out a card, I didn't realize that was going to put me on the podium, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I would echo a lot of what he just said. I am, I think that. You know, Kevin Russell, I know you're following all the science and following the, the state mandates and everything like that. Just ask that, you know, once it does become optional, that you do provide families the option. Uh, you know, as the last speaker, I also coach a lot of the, uh, the teams in the area and stuff like that. I think that, you know, having students mask in a school that has no air conditioning, 
I think is probably more detrimental to their health than having a mask on. Um, once again, I know that and respect that you know you can't change the governor's decision, but I would ask that you collectively go with all the other superintendents and go against the governor to try to get that reversed. Because I know that you know we aren't the only school district that doesn't have air conditioning. So I think that you know there's a lot of other impacts that it'll have. You know, you mentioned, you know, the, you know, just the visual and everything, but it's also, you know, bacteria on the mask and things like that. It's just not, that's not healthy or safe for the students at all. So, um, I, d I did have uh, one question, you know, you guys talked about uh, doing the snack breaks outside and everything. What about when the weather turns? Are they going to be able to have snack breaks inside the school? Has that been considered yet or? You just want to provide a yeah, um, yeah typically we don't do q a a public comment but i oh. will hear uh, what justin did indicate is that is exactly what we're trying to accomplish in all of our classrooms and um, we do want to um, work with our teachers once they get back to see how we can make that happen especially in adverse weather conditions you are right during um, nice weather it's, it's a no-brainer uh, as it gets cooler you know october and then really up until may uh, we would run into issues with that so we are working with our staff when they come back to plan for that Thank perfect you. great that's all i have thank you thank you Appreciate it. valerie drews welcome Hello, my name is Valerie Drews and I have two children who live within District 58. They would be entering second grade in kindergarten at Kingsley. Due to the mandates and circumstances over the last two years, our family decided not to send our kids to Kingsley Elementary because we did not want them to carry the weight of this pandemic on their shoulders and be forced to follow medical advice from politicians. As a public school educator for 10 years, I cannot imagine my child learning language, sitting in a kindergarten classroom, not seeing their teacher's face. I come to you this evening, and I know that you've mentioned the um, mandates, and what I'd like to hear, I've been at several board meetings, is more districts giving heat to the uh, governor instead of just complying. But I come to you this evening to ask you to make masks optional as soon as possible. For the families who have survived COVID and now test reactive positive and have protective antibodies, for the families who have the right to choose the best, what is best for their own health, make these masks optional. For the kids with anxiety, for the kids whose vision is impaired by masks, for the kids with inhalers and breathing difficulties under normal circumstances, for the kids with migraines worsened by extended mask wearing, for the special needs kids, the kids that don't respond well to wearing a mask, and for the hearing impaired who cannot read lips through a mask. For the for the fostering of proper social development among children, for freedom of expression, facial expression, for freedom of choice and parents' right to choose how to best protect and provide and raise their own children. You'll all, you all know that this has nothing to do with health and safety. Not once has the state focused on how to keep children healthy. We have been living normal lives all summer. This is about control and compliance. With regards to masks, the facts are in fact clear on this. The COVID virus is, a, is small enough to easily pass through any basic cloth mask. It even listed on any of the sides of a Target or Old Navy mask, which is most of the masks our children are wearing, that it does not provide protection from COVID. For true protection, vulnerable individuals should be fitted for an N95 mask. The, for the average child, they are unlikely to have a significant reaction to COVID and are poor vectors of transmission. Furthermore, even, in the, even the World Health Organization does not support the use of masks during exercise for children due to breathing concerns. There are many medical conditions in children that may be worsened by mask wearing, including oxygenation levels for children with compressed airways. A child breathing through a mask all day is not only harmful psychologically, but physically as they breathe in their carbon dioxide all day. Again, this is a decision that should be made it weighed with a parent in collaboration of a healthcare provider. We are not a zero risk society. Not one of uh, the board uh, that I've been to have mentioned how suicide has increased over the past 
couple of years with this pandemic. I could go on and on, I don't have time, but there are 121 deaths each year in school bus related crashes. Each year about 100 children die in bicycle related instances and in 2017 and 18, there were 643 children who have died of the flu. I can't go on, but thank you for your time. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Elise Churchill. Hi, I'm Elise Churchill. My, I have two daughters at Kingsley Elementary. Um, over the past 18 months, I've seen my confident, social, school-loving child, excuse me, lose all confidence, become angry, anxious, dreading school, in therapy, and on the verge of an eating disorder. My child is an extremely emotionally attuned person <clears throat> who reacts strongly to her personal interactions. While blocking facial expressions, masks have contributed to her anxiety surrounding school and interactions with peers and her teachers. She can no longer use these facial clues to put context <clears throat> to much of what is said verbally and, has had a, and it has had a huge impact on her confidence and emotional and social well-being. And I know she's not the only one going through this. Our kids have a better chance of getting struck by lightning from di than dying of COVID. For the well-being of our children, a group who has made the most sacrifice for adults of the world over the last 18 months, I ask you to make a decision you know is right and make masks optional. Um, we, we know that these masks do not block the virus. I understand that it's always been about money and funding and compliance, but that has to change. We need to put the needs of our children first. ISB is not going to stop with these mask rules unless the schools push back, which is why we are pushing back as parents. What I'm hearing the board from the board is that you're saying your hands are tied, and that's not the case. Other schools in Illinois have stood up to ISB and made masks optional because they have recognized that this mandate is not based on science, but based on control, and is not in the best interest of our children and their well-being. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Last card, uh, Christina Gansel. The Village Hall has shared that they would like everyone in a mask in their facility. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Christina Gansel. I have two children that attend Kingsley. I'd first like to thank Dr. Russell and the board members for their efforts since the start of this pandemic. I do believe that your efforts over the past 18 months has been with the best intentions. I come to you with the utmost concern regarding the mandates our tyrannical governor has attempted to impose on us recently. I know at the meeting on August 9th, Dr. Russell addressed the mask mandate at the start of the meeting, stating that the district would be following his orders due to the threat of funding and insurance. Has the board consulted lawyers regarding this mandate? I'm sure you are aware that Pritzker and Isby do not have the authority to do this. We also know that there are board members that do not believe we should be following these mandates. When I say we, I am speaking on behalf of numerous parents who are awake, aware, and extremely upset. You all know deep in your hearts that the children are not the super spreaders. How many children in your district were actually hospitalized or died of COVID last year? These mandates do so much more damage, not only health-wise, but mentally. I witnessed this firsthand this past school year while we had to seek help for my eight-year-old son due to depression and anxiety. A lot of people who suffer from depression often suffer silently and alone. How many of our children are actually suffering and we just don't realize it? How can you say you want to do what is right for the children and continue to muzzle them up knowing that these issues exist? Since COVID, it's been estimated that 20% of kids have undiagnosed mental illness. That's one in five kids. Yet the number of kids that are receiving treatment for mental illness is not that high. That means that a large number of our children and youth are dealing with a genuine health condition without getting help. 
This is so much bigger than masks. This is about taking a stand and doing the right thing. Resisting an agenda that has nothing to do with the health of American young minds, but to teach subordination. This is about teaching compliance. How can you sit there as leaders of education in our community and not push to educate our children on what is right? It's because of compliance that none of this madness will end. It will continue unless you say no. Where is the common sense? 400,000 people attended Lollapalooza. The borders are open, the malls are packed, summer fests continue, and yet children must be masked seven hours a day. Do you not see what is happening here? The propaganda behind this agenda is endless and extremely comparable to late 1930s Nazi Germany. What is the point of teaching history if we are doomed to repeat it? Currently, there are 25 plus schools that I personally confirmed in Illinois that are not following the governor's mandate. How about you do the right thing and join them in saying no to this far left agenda that continues to tear our nation apart? This country was founded on freedom, the freedom to make the choice. Many fought and died for that. This is our fight now and should not be placed on our children. Do the right thing and make masking optional in 58. All right, thank you. That was the last comment tonight. With that, we will now move on to our consent agenda. Are there any items tonight that a board member would like to have considered separately? If not, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda consisting of the personnel report as presented in the packet of materials? So moved. Second. Second. All right. Uh, Kevin, can you please cover? Member Olchak. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi? Aye. Member Hannes? Aye. Member Harris? Aye. And Board President Hughes? Aye. The motion carried. The consent agenda has been approved as presented in the packet of the materials. And in that consent agenda, we just hired a new assistant principal. So, Dr. Russell, if you'd like to share a little bit about it. Yeah, I would. Hi. Thank you for that. Uh, District 58 recently concluded a competitive interview process to identify a new assistant principal for O'Neill Middle School. We're pleased to recommend Mr. Brian Coble to fill this role. Mr. Coble comes to District 58 from West Aurora School, District 129, where he served as the Dean of Students for Washington Middle School since 2020. In this role, Mr. Coble worked with students, staff, and families to develop behavior guidelines. He also collaborated with teachers to create classroom management strategies and implement social emotional learning uh, and classroom technology. Prior to this role, he served as a middle school Spanish teacher in Naperville Community Unit District 203 and Mount Prospect School District 57 for nine years. The O'Neill assistant principal interview team spoke very highly of Mr. Coble and was most impressed by his variety of experiences, enthusiasm, strong relationships with students, the staff, and parents, and his eagerness to expand his leadership abilities. Mr. Coble earned his master's degree in educational leadership from North Central College and his bachelor's degree in Spanish language and literature from Northern Illinois University. On behalf of the Board of Education in District 58 in our community, Brian, we want to welcome you to O'Neill Middle School and thank you for joining our team. Uh, hi, everyone. Just wanted to say thank you for the opportunity and I'm excited to work uh, at O'Neill and with the Downers Grove community. So thank you very much. Welcome. Welcome. Uh, thank welcome. You. Welcome. Thank you. All right, we just have two uh, items up for action tonight. The first one is a proposal of e-learning program. Is there a motion to approve the e-learning plan for the school district for year 21 through 22, 22 through 23, and 24 through 25 as presented? So moved. Second. All right, discussion. Why are we going to 24 to 25? It should be 23 to 24, right? The last year? It should, you're right. You take a year off, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, it is a three year plan. All right, so let me reread that. I'm, this is a motion now to approve the e learning plan for school year 21 through 22, 22 through 23, and 23 through 24 as presented. So moved. Second. All right. Now we have discussion. Um, I have a couple things to say. Um, I'm going to start. I, I have a lot to say actually, so I'll, I'll go ahead and start. Um, 
by addressing uh, the comments during um, the hearing from Mr. Schmidt and Mrs. Mayhey. Thank you very much for coming. I really appreciate that your comments were about kids. Um, I feel like we need to talk more about kids uh, last month when we had this conversation. Um, I do agree with what you're saying in principle. Um, you talked about preserving the continuity of learning. Um, absolutely, I think that's, that's, that's uh, a, a great selling point on this. Um, my concern, which hasn't really been addressed yet on that issue though, is I think the 2.5 hours of, of synchronous instruction is a, is a way for preserving the continuity of learning, but the other two and a half hours of asynchronous time is, uh, as I understand it, there'll be packets mailed home in the next couple of weeks. So I don't see how we can possibly plan for to preserving the continuity of learning when we don't know when that break is going to take place. So if, if let's say we have a snow day in January, how do we know what materials our kids need this week or next week to preserve that continuity of learning? Um, I agree about the, the fatigue setting in at the end of the year. Um, I also am concerned about the lack of executive functioning that our kids have with, with remote learning. I, there's a certain fatigue that sets in after staring at a screen for several hours by yourself in your bedroom. Uh, um, and there's, uh, you know, there's, there's not, for many of our kids who are doing this at home by themselves, there's not that, um, it's not, they don't have the, they, they, it's easy to get fatigued when there's no way they're kind of encouraging you to, to, to keep going. Um, I, uh, another argument that was made in public comment was that uh, uh, teachers and admin have learned a lot over the last year. Um, I agree with that as well. Uh, my problem is I have a four-year-old son, and my four-year-old son has never done remote learning before. He'll be a kindergartner next year. So I don't see how he benefits from that at all when you give him a, a, a Chromebook or a, an iPad in, in January and say, you know, here you go. You have no experience doing this at all. This, this, is, this is not going to be good for him. This is not going to be an effective uh, way to instruct him even for one day. Um, I, have, I wanted to address uh, my next point, the data that, the, um, that was presented to us by the administration. First of all, um, I guess my feedback uh, to the administration going forward is when you have uh, a, an issue like this, which, which you know is divisive among your board, give us more than two hours to respond to uh, a survey. Um, we got this after 3.30 on, on Wednesday and it was queued up to go out at 5.30. Um, and there wasn't time, I mean, it was already queued up by the time I made the phone call. Uh, my problem, I had a problem with the question. Um, the question I don't really think re reflected the conversation that this board had last month on, Jan on July 12th. Um, I, the first time somebody asked me about this, I would, I would have voted yes. I just, I understand the issue a lot better. The question asked, would you rather have an e-learning day in lieu of a traditional emergency day? Yeah, I mean, if, if, if uh, schools are closed because it's negative 30, do I want my kids playing Switch all day, or do I want them doing something uh, constructive and something that's going to shape their minds? Absolutely. But what I, I think that uh, you know, Mr. Hughes and I spoke um, the, the most strongly in opposition to this last month. Our, our concern is not about that. Our concern is about the trade-off that families are making is, would you rather have a day in J June where you're going to be in school, which is the best way for our kids to learn, is that more uh, favorable than having a day in the winter when you are in front of a, a Chromebook for two and a half hours and then you're just you're doing worksheets and, and whatnot for the other two and a half hours. Uh, so I didn't like the question. I think just going forward, I think we should, the board should be given some more time to um, to uh, take a look at those things. So uh, looking into the data, um, there was it, there was certainly an overwhelming amount of our community who supported this. But um, you know, if I read every single comment. There were um, 180 comments from people who voted yes to the survey, who, who, should, who uh, expressed support for this, this option. Um, so out of those 180 comments, you know, I dug in a little bit, 4% um, uh, of them, 3.9% thought we were talking about COVID. So, um, you know, I'll, let's take that with a grain of salt. 7.2% uh, are worried about, are, are saying they don't want to have the days go longer into June because we already get out later than we than we than most other districts around us because you don't have air conditioning. Um, I'm, I, I, they, they, they favor, some of them favored heat days, uh, using these emergency days as, uh, to get out of school for heat days, which um, that's um, I don't know if that's in, in, in conversation, but that problem could be solved in general if with a referendum in a couple of years. 
Um, so I don't know, this, this is kind of like the, the paradigm going forward. If we agree to this tonight, then this is something that's gonna be in District 58 forever. I know it's only a three year plan, but we're not gonna just quit doing it after the community gets used to it. So it'll be re-upped in three years, I'm sure. Um, but so the, to the families who are worried about our, our buildings being hot, I'm, I'm hopeful that there's a solution to that. 11.1% um, still want traditional snow days. And um, I, I mean, and they, they said this should only be used in the, in the most extreme situations, which I agree with. I think it should only be used in the most extreme situations, but there's, um, that's not really, there's no uh, clear guardrails in this plan for when this is gonna be used. It's just gonna be used judiciously, which is a, um, not as a subjective term. And uh, of, again, of the people who, who voted yes, and who also left a comment, so we're not talking about everybody who voted yes, but everybody who voted yes and, used, and left a comment, 13.9%, uh, um, and I'm, not, I'm, I'm worried that 13.9% didn't read the external link because the, their, their comments were, saying, were things saying um, they're concerned about um, the plan, uh, they don't want the plan to look like remote learning did last year, which it does. Uh, they're concerned about asynchronous time being ineffective. Uh, they don't want busy work, they don't want videos. They're worried about students with special needs. And I share all those concerns. So I, 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 I'm, I guess I, overall, I, I appreciate the data, but I'm not 100% sure it's, it's telling us what we think it's telling us. When we just say 75% of families are, are in favor of this, I'm not really sure I agree with that, but that's okay. Um, I, I have another question about data. At the, Jan, at the July 12th board meeting, I requested that the administration provide data uh, of quantitative uh, analysis of, of how, um, how our students fared under remote learning. I think that could be provided, I think it's a reasonable request that could have been, put, could have been provided, has not been provided. You know, if, we're, if we are going to put, uh, as we like to say, a tool in our toolbox, I think we need to vet out this tool and we have the ability to do that. And um, so I'm, I, I, I wish we'd been provided with that data to be able to say, hey, this is um, something that is a reasonable substitution for in-person instruction, or we can say the data that says it's better than in-person instruction, maybe, I don't know. But if it's, if it's not, I'd like to know that. Um, and I, I, I guess I'm frustrated that that wasn't provided to uh, the board before this meeting, before we can make this um, decision. Um, I, I guess overall, I, I just wanna go back to the data really quick. Um, you know, the, the, the idea that the, you know, a, a, an overwhelming majority of our family supports this. Um, I, I said the last meeting, I'll say it again here tonight, I think this is a, a problem with equity. I think that there's a lot of families who this is fine for, who work from home, who, um, or have the flexibility in their careers to work from home, and they can, um, they can support their kids and their learning throughout the day. I think that's not a reality for a lot of our families. Um, families who don't get snow days, who don't get to work from home because they work hourly wages, uh, they have to get up at, at 6 a.m. to get to their shift at, um, at Walmart, for example, and uh, those kids aren't gonna be supported the way my kids are gonna be supported, and I think that just inherently creates equity. So that's, that's the problem with majority rules, because majority rules doesn't really work when you're talking about equity. Um, if we said, you know, 75% of our kids are learning, great, uh, but that's never really been our, our tact as a board. We've always said, hey, we, we, we are a high-performing district, but we need to look at all these other kids whose who's, um, academic needs aren't being met with our universal instruction. So I, 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 I really caution this board is to, to look at the people who are saying no and why they're saying no, um, because they're, they're telling you it's not good for their kids. And, um, and they're saying it's, it's, it's a hardship on their families to, um, to provide the support during the, the day to do this. And they're saying that, this, that their kids aren't gonna learn this way. So I, 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 I'm, I'm opposed to this as, as much as I was uh, last month and um, and I'll just be quiet for a while, I guess, and I'll just listen to what the other members have to say about this. Well, Gr Greg, I appreciate your passion on this. I, I just want to understand a little bit more about the, the data that you're, you're looking for in just terms of like the validity of remote learning in general versus... I, I think we have a lot of anecdotal data from, from the past year from families who are saying that my kids have struggled with remote learning. Um, you know, I'm thinking about, it, I don't, was it in March or February? We were at O'Neill in the in the gymnasium or the cafeteria, and we had a lot of families saying, "You know, this has been bad for my kids for X, Y, and Z." Um, so I don't I don't understand. I guess I've I've just struggled with with the um, the interest in, in providing more 
of this tool to our families where we don't really have a body of data to support its efficacy. Um, and that's, that's, you know, I, I think we should be able to, I, I think this is a board that, that likes to make kids first decisions based on data. And that's, that's, that's the data I was looking for to understand how this tool has fared in our district over the last year. I got you. Well, I, because I, 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 I just want to say, like, I, I think what you're saying, and this is where I, I, I've been arguing the whole time, this is a fundamental change in the way that we're delivering education for five days of school year. The burden of proof. Maybe. The, this, the, the burden of proof is on the new plan, not on, it, it, we're not saying, okay, we, we've never done anything before. We, we've got to pick something because it's required. There's no timeliness to it. There's no reason we have to do it right now. We do not have the data. There are already school districts, now granted there are high school districts, that are already advocating to try to find out how to maximize the five-day value and get them all out of the school year. And I'm not saying we have a team here in this district that wants to do it right now. But right now we're just using the word, you know, we're going to use it judiciously. We, we had people coming to us previously and, we're, and, and we had kids that built muscle memory. In 23-24, when our kindergartners are first and our second graders, our youngest learners, the ones that it's hardest for, are never have had this experience and they're just gonna pop in. I have, no, I have a lot of faith that our teachers can have learned a lot on how to deliver that. We got pretty good at, at doing a lot of these things, but that doesn't mean on the other set end of the screen that a two and a half hour synchronous day and two and a half hours of homework um, equates the equivalent to a school day. And that is a, that is a tectonic shift from what we've done before. And uh, I, you know, we, we talked about leadership. I think sometimes leadership is, is not just being in the first wave. It's sometimes when all your friends are saying, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, is sometimes having the courage to say, I'm not going to do this right now. I'm going to wait, and I'm going I'm to look to see if those numbers align. And I think that's what, what Greg was talking to today. We don't have that data. And um, we go to school 176 days. Um, I, we've already got people writing us telling us, I'm not doing that. I was at the pool the other day, and some of the dads were talking about, hey, my kid's not going to do that. If it's a snow day, I'm, my kid. And then I was talking to my wife, and I'm like, yeah, I don't have to do it. You know, if, if people don't see value in it, it's just up to five days less of a school year. And I, I, that is everything that goes against everything I fought for in the last 18 months on getting our kids in front of their teachers, learning in an environment that's designed to work with young learners. This is not high school. I, the argument in high school, when you're talking about, well, if we lose a couple of days in semester one, why would we put it in semester two? I think you can make a very valid argument why this belongs in a high school. I think you've got a different age kid that needs less support maybe at home. I still think there's equity issues there, but I, I think it's, but you cannot tell me that every second grader can function when they might have two parents out of the house and grandma's got to come sit with them or whatever it might be, that they're getting an equitable education, that they're not going to have a gap when they come back if some kid's got something or something else, or that a, that a packet or a worksheet equates to a, a full day with their teachers. We're not talking about specials. We're not talking about any other components that go along with the school day. I appreciate the fact that we, the initial recommendation was for an hour and a half of, of, of learning time and then three and a half hours of homework. And we, and we flip that to two and a half and two and a half. But it's got to equal a school day for me, and, it, and I, I, don't, I don't see it. But I have, a, I have a question. Go ahead, Tracy. Um, Kevin, mm -hmm. if this is a, a, a three year, we're, we're putting this plan forward to the state, so it's on record mm -hmm. for three years. Is there any reason why, if we did it, we, we, it passes and it goes, that at the end of this year, as a board, we make this an agenda item to talk about it. It's actually required as part of the plan that we review it annually. <laughs> oh, perfect! So, we so there's a possibility, like for one year, we can we goes. can do it and see what the what Mother Nature what it was like this year, and and and, 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 and say, eh, audit it again. just like we audited the um, early release Mondays. We we said we're going to do this. We're going to invest in this, and we're going to talk about it at the end of the at the end of the year is that correct that is certainly part of the requirement as justin shared i i do want to jump in just on a a couple of clarifying points at least from the administration side and, and i really appreciate the the board feedback um one of the things i want to reiterate um we we heard our teachers here tonight um i, I don't want anyone to think that we're envisioning this as two and a half hours on the computer and then you're on your own we got an enormous amount of feedback about how we structure remote learning to initially start the school year 
where it was a combination of synchronous and asynchronous time that was spread out throughout the entire day. The requirement is two and a half hours of that live time. But what we saw in the fall was a great deal of, okay, I'm gonna give you some direct instruction. I want you to go back and work in groups or I want you to work on your own. Then you're gonna come back. Then we're gonna continue uh, to do that. Of course, at the middle school, it's more of a, a period structure. So it looks a little bit um, different. We also got an enormous amount of feedback about the amount of time that our kids can handle being on the screen. And so that is why you're not seeing that it's you know a, a minute for minute. Um, but I want to remind everyone what school looks like on a normal day. It is not six hours of straight lecture. Um, it is cooperative grouping. It's a little bit of direct instruction, then going out and doing things. So we feel as an administration, this plan closely mirrors not only remote learning what we saw in the fall, but we would what we see in our classrooms every day. Is it the exact same time? No, we've been very, very clear on that. And that's because of the nature of the screen. In terms of data, um, and, and I will own if, if we did not you know, go back and ask specifically what kind of data, um, the data that, that we have always referenced throughout this is the survey data that we got back on remote learning feedback. And then also at the June meeting, we did present data overall about how our students fared in one year. I think it is a, you know, um, extremely, uh, or it's a fair point to say that we don't have data on uh, an e-learning day in lieu of an emergency day. I, I want to be clear, I don't know how we would ever get that data moving forward because if you're only talking about five days a year, it's going to be extremely challenging to, you know, parse that out amongst what you, what you have already seen. Um, I want to also address the packet issue. Our teachers will provide, they always do, uh, quality work. It, it won't just be, you know, an obscure packet. Um, every time we talk to the board about stuff like this, we take it back with our working groups and with our staff. Our, our, our teachers have the ability to deliver those quality lessons, so I am not worried about that. They have demonstrated that time and time again, and, and I have full confidence um, and, and in let me, that. And let me just and, and I know that's not what you were saying. That's not what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, I, I, I have a lot of confidence. All my kids' teachers have been wonderful at Leicester. I guess, um, it just it's just um i don't i i, I don't know like let's let's say they're, they're preparing packets right now to start the school year and you're gonna put a sign in, in front of my kid and, and it, it's just gonna pop up someday how valuable is that assignment if it's not something that's part of like the normal year we might not even use that at all so that's that's just it's, it's just something extra that's, that's that's it's not crucial to teaching whatever skill they're working on it's something that's that's in theory. If we have zero emergency days, then it won't be taught at all. So it's not. It, it, so I don't, it inherently can't be something fundamental or something that uh, is going to be of the highest of of impact. Can I just? It was then be it would be part of the normal curriculum. I think I think we might be overemphasizing the print material component of the plan. So the print materials are referenced in the plan as an answer to the idea that on an emergency day. There could also be connectivity issues, despite our best efforts, and so there could be families who would not be able to connect digitally. And so That's I, I an don't. Issue. I'm sorry. That's an equity issue. Just that, just just for the for the record. Correct. That's not always an equity issue. But it, it can't be. Power outages aren't. Right, but so some families don't have sorry, the connection at all. Sure, home. but that's not what he was referencing. I understand it, but I'm just pointing out that it's also another equity issue. So the point I was intending to make is that I think the characterization of two and a half hours of time with the teacher and two and a half hours of packets is an inaccurate representation of the plan. The other delivery of material would be through Seesaw and Google Classroom, which is actually a skill that our students will practice daily throughout the course of their actual in-person schooling because these are tools we regularly use that are then accessible remotely. The print material is supplementary in the event that those accessibility pieces came into play in an emergency. And in order to address equity, just like we did last year, and I know Dr. Eichmiller can speak to this as well, um, if we did approve a plan like this, a um, couple of points. That in terms of the equity and internet connection, we have ways of providing free internet. We, we did that throughout the pandemic. We also have hotspots to um, give to children. That being said, there can always be a connectivity issue. Um, you know, the recent power outages have demonstrated that throughout our, our, our school district. and so. It's a redundancy built in, in the event the kid was disconnected um, from their learning. Um, in terms of that word, judiciously, you are exactly correct. It is a subjective term. 
Um, snow days are always a subjective term. I used to say that was the most challenging part of my job. Uh, that was obviously pre-COVID. Um, I can tell you as a school superintendent and as an elementary parent, I believe in the snow day every once in a while. I believe in kids needing a break. I believe in that free mental health day throughout the year. But there's a difference to me when we're looking at this in terms of those multiple cold days after you've been in the winter for four months. And, and I do think we would have significant pushback from our families if we had two or three cold days, which we have had. Doesn't happen often, but we have had that. And we didn't have that flexibility or that tool. So what we're advocating for is that flexibility in the event we saw those multiple days. Um, I recognize every point that was made in terms of elementary students versus older students. It is a challenge. It's not always the parent who's able to assist. It could be, in my case, it would be grandma, right? And, and um, you know, that wouldn't necessarily be the most ideal thing for some families. Uh, but what this is, is for those longer period of times, that's what we're really looking at if we found ourselves in, in, in something like that. The, the other question I had was, um, and you might not know, but taking the temperature of the DuPage County room, what are, are a lot of our contemporaries around us submitting a plan? Yeah. Um, Prior to COVID, you started to see a lot of momentum with the high school districts doing this. Um, most of our uh, neighboring school districts are in lieu of an emergency day using this as an option. I cannot say that they're going to always use it or they won't have a traditional snow day, uh, but most of our neighboring school districts, including the 99 feeders, have adopted this. Have, have submitted mm -hmm. for with the state, okay. So wouldn't it be a great case study to watch how some of them worked out and then come back and have this conversation. Anytime we have this conversation, we submit it in. Now we have real data. And 30 days later, we can have a plan in place. Right now, this was dead on arrival. And I understand this is a different board right now. But when it came across this board, it was dead on arrival. And it was dead on arrival in every elementary school. And I feel like there's this haze of COVID-19 right now. And there's this fear of being caught flat-footed without an e-learning plan. But it is so important to understand that this plan has nothing to do with a long-term pandemic or a long-term thing that would ever keep us out of our school district. This is specifically to take five days of our school year and move them or have the ability to move them into an e-learning day. And, and you already see in districts that have implemented this. If you remember when we were little kids, right, we would wait, we'd get up in the morning and wait for that thing to scroll on WGN to find out if our school was closed. And, and as schools have implemented this plan, there's an eager call to make this earlier and earlier in the day, and we've seen bad calls. We made a call last year, and I got up in the morning, didn't even have to shovel my driveway, and drove to Evanston. I think that, I think it's a, uh, I, I think there's always, I think there's a risk in, in doing this, and I think that there is nothing hindering us from ever bringing this across the board again. But as we know, and most of these things go in place, once this is implemented, I know it's a three-year plan, but it will never go away. So I, I just wanted to just once again just say to Mrs. Mayhay, I, I apologize if I put my foot in my mouth about, about the, uh, the, the continuity of learning conversation. I, that's not, it's not what I intended. I, like I said, I, I have full confidence that the teaching staff can put um, something great together for, um, for that aspect of the piece. Uh, but I don't want that to be a distraction from like, what my overall concerns are. I, I mentioned equity. I mentioned the lack of data, really understanding how our kids fared under remote learning last year. But the third piece is, is, um, is Kevin, you brought up this word judiciously. We keep talking about this word judiciously. And, and uh, I feel like uh, I, sh I wish I had a nickel for every time I've, I've, I've heard somebody say judiciously in the last two months since we talked about this, it, this, this plan. Um, this is not a word we can hold our superintendent accountable to. It is very, it's very subjective. Um, Darren, you, I, and I, I, you mentioned it just a second ago. Um, I, I, Kevin, I apologize. I, um, but the, we did, the, on January 26th, we, the call was wrong. I know it's not entirely your fault because you don't make that decision in a vacuum, but we called it at 624 p.m. the night before a storm that delivered less than three inches and was done snowing by 730 in the morning. So, um, that, and that, again, like, that's not, one superintendent doesn't make that decision by himself. He's, up, he's on the phone with other superintendents around, around the area, all the, all the feeders in the 99, and they all, they all make the call together because there's, cause there's, there's uh, safety numbers there. But, if it's this plan just makes it easier to get the call wrong because there's with well I, I, there's only three inches of snow but we had the kids had their their backup emergency um uh what do you call it e-learning plans 
so that, that, that gives me concern. I, I, so my, my third, like I said, my third major concern is just the lack of guardrails. I don't know what this means. I can't, I can't define judiciously. I don't know when this is gonna be used. I agree, Kevin, I do see some merit in having a, a backup plan for when we're gonna be closed for three straight days because it's gonna be negative 30 um, and the wind chills are gonna be negative 50, um, but that's not in this plan. And that, that's not spelled out. It's just, we just keep saying judiciously. And, and, and I said it before and I'll say it again. Um, I have um, the utmost faith in you as our superintendent. And, and my greatest regret is that you're not always gonna be our superintendent. And we're gonna have other superintendents who are gonna come after you who might have a different definition of judicious. And um, I, I think, you know, with proper guardrails, as I've expressed before, with proper guardrails, I could probably support this, but just that it's just too loose for me. I'm good. Couple, couple things. Um, <laughs> so, Greg, to your point about talking about the continuity of learning and a packet going home of materials that might not necessarily be continuous, um, I want to push back a little bit on the fact that you're, it's, I don't think this is exactly your intention, but kind of saying that those things therefore have no educational value since they don't follow continuity of learning. Completely disagree with that. I think there's oh, tons of things that we could provide to our students on the first day of school that could have tremendous educational value in February, regardless if they're following the continuous content aligned no, time frame of the school I year. agree with you. Think about a hundred skills that we want our students to learn that probably are really honestly the most important skills outside of the actual content of English, math, social studies, science, etc., critical thinking. Um, you know, you could name a hundred skills that we want them to focus on. You could provide countless activities that address those skills that would be very, very um, valued in terms of their educational experience and they don't follow the content, the continuous. So I just push back I, on that I, a I, bit. That's, that's fine and fair, although um, I will just say like the reason I just bring it up is because since the first time I heard about this, like I, I said at the last meeting this is a, a solution in search of a problem. And um, one, of, one of the defenses of this, of this plan from the administration was this continuity of learning plan. So I don't, I don't deny for a second that, there, that there's not value in, in some of those activities, even if, if they don't fill in um, pre precisely where they need to in the scope and sequence of a curricula, curriculum. Um, but uh, if, if, if continuity is, is one of the biggest advantages of this plan, it's not necessarily lined up and we are pre 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 planning these days several months in advance. I understand what you're saying, but if we're having two and a half hours of synchronous time in the plan, and then sure. you have two and a half hours of unsynchronous time, sure. obviously the synchronous time is going to be is going to follow your continuum of education. And, and, but that's, 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 but that's so why. Other two and a half hours, there's still educational value to that. That doesn't, and, and that could be part of any school day. There's a million times you know you were a teacher. You know you get off on a a tangent about something and you end up having like your best discussion and it was not in your lesson plan that day but wow what a great day that was and my kids were so engaged and they loved it. Sure. I don't disagree with that at all uh, but my preference has always been I'd rather have my kids in school for a full day I'm um, getting a full day of instruction from their teachers than two and a half days. I think there's more value in that day inherently uh, even if it's in June and even if uh, it's uh, it, it pushes us a little bit farther in summer. I think there's more value in that day than there is um, in a day where they're in front of a computer for two and a half hours and then uh, kind of working asynchronously, asynchronously for two and a half hours. Okay. And then another um, couple things. Um, the idea that I, I kind of I don't know. I, I, like Tracy brought up the point of you know this is we're submitting this as a three-year approved plan, and so we have this plan as approved for three years. That doesn't necessarily mean that we have to use it for all three of those years. Could we as a board, as Tracy was kind of saying, say, okay, we're gonna go forward right now. And then next year in June or July or whenever, we're gonna look back at the year and say, how did it go? What did we think about it? How many days did we use? How were they used? What's the feedback? We could certainly include that as a survey question at the end of the year to families, et cetera, to gather some feedback on how it went, if we use them at all, because we don't know that we even will use them throughout the course of the school year. And then we could decide going into 22, 23, do we want to authorize the district to use those e-learning days again? Is that possible? Like, even though it's approved by the county or the state of Harbor is approving it, it's approved, but can we say whether we allow the administration to say we're gonna use it in the following school year, or can we make this like, we're gonna do a one-year trial and see how it goes, and then we'll move forward from there. Yeah, there is would, that possible? There would, nothing, there would be nothing that would prevent a board from 
asking for an agenda item uh -huh. to revoke an okay. e-learning plan. Okay. Just because you submit it to the state uh -huh. um, doesn't mean that you couldn't take that away right. through board action. Okay, so I think that's something to consider too. Obviously, there's some concern over how it's going to be used. Is it going to be used appropriately or not? So we could potentially test that out. I personally um, also kind of agree that I do like the idea of a snow day. I think that's fun. I think it's a nice needed break at times, but when it runs into two or three days in a row of cold days, that's a different story. So I, the idea, and we are all hating this word judiciously, but I trust the administration to make that call. I'm not worried that they're going to abuse that power. And again, yeah, we're talking about this administration, but down the line, boards always have the power to, to take that back. I kind of disagree, Darren, that once it's there, it, you're never gonna take it away. I don't think that's true. I think you can take it away if you want. So if a board wants to do it, they do it. You know, it's up to the board that's there at the time. Um, There's gonna be a change in boards, and, and here's sure. what happens. Something just becomes sure. ingrained in, and no one thinks about it anymore. And it's mm -hmm. one of the reasons why. Th there's a comparison going on with um, early release Mondays. And I think that's actually, you know, at first I didn't think that was necessarily a good comparison, but it, it, it kind of is. We were not one of the first school districts to do that. And um, I will tell you, as we started having conversations on a, on a previous board makeup, we really started talking about that because there are horror stories we heard from districts where they're absolutely useless days and, and how they weren't working and how they, it was really just a reduction of, of time with students and it was not having any value. And from that, we had really nice discussions with with, with Justin and, and how do we form these days? How do we have a discussion? How do we look at them and, and know that they're successful? Because we learn from watching things not work in another district. And I, I, I'm saying we do the same thing here. I, I see no arc to this um, needing to be done right now. I don't see a, a path to, to success when you have kindergartners and first and second graders trying to learn. I'm not saying that it can't be done, what I'm, and, I, and I think the tremendous things were done. I think our teachers did a phenomenal job, but I can't imagine having uh, Greg's incoming kindergartner in, what, two years, he's in? Next year. Next year? Um, coming in fresh and then having to hit one of those days. Uh, you know, if, if both of them happen to be in the office you know, and not being able to be there that day, it would be very difficult uh, to get a, a five-year-old or a six-year-old uh, in, engaged in that day and have value in that. And after being forced to not be in a building for so long and advocating so hard to return to normalcy, to even strip us of a, of a few days, I'm, I'm not ready to do that. I think that we should do it when the fog of COVID-19 clears and we have better visibility. I believe that some of those numbers that came in that survey was out of fear of, of coming out flat-footed uh, when something else happens. And uh, I, I think this is a, a disappointing action. I, I, I'm anticipating um, that I'm in the minority tonight, but uh, uh, so can, at can this I point I'll Can I just say that I love that we're able to talk like this and have pretty- No. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's so wonderful that we're on a board that we all can respectfully have a different opinion mm -hmm. and I love it and that's why I love working with you guys. So I just have to say, I've, I've talked to you before and I've heard your statements before and you're very, very, both of you are very, very passionate about it. And I love you all for, and I, that's why I'm glad you're on the board. I, I passionately have a different opinion and that's okay. And good people, what does Kevin always say? Good people can disagree. So I personally think a day in February on a cold day that nobody can go out instead of playing switch, having kids, because they're already, they were already at school the day before to do it is much better than in June when people are already practicing dolls, having baseball games at seven or eight o'clock at night, not getting home until nine, because I'm telling you, second graders have late games. <laughs> it is better to have them engaged in February than a, a day in June when everybody is ready to get the heck out of school. Is that so, so I passionately have a different opinion, but I love that we can all talk about this, and I think that that's a win for our board personally. Well, oh, cheers, Tracy, and it's a, a win for our district too because boards that don't function well, that detriment goes down all the way down in the classroom. So um, I'll, I'll close by just uh, making a couple of comments on what Darren said. Um, one, just to reiterate, you made a point about how we work so hard to get kids back in, in the classroom. That was on the slide in the Return to Learn presentation. Our emphasis on in-person instruction over the last year. 
And the second thing I'll say in regards to Emily, um, I'll give you some props. They're in my notes. I just didn't get to it. Um, last week I want to talk about, last month I really want to talk about kids. Um, I felt like you were ready to have that conversation with me uh, about, about you know, I, I, I make some assertions that I don't think this is good for a lot of our kids. And at least you, your, your response was, um, I disagree, and here's why I think this is good for kids. So, you know, again, I, I, anytime we can, we can have a conversation where this is uh, a kid, um, a kid-centered decision, my hat's off to you. Um, but in regards to what you said, um, you know, in terms of like testing this and then analyzing it, there's never been my, that's never been uh, my, my preference. I feel like we shouldn't shoot first and ask questions later. Um, we should uh, understand how this is gonna impact our kids a little bit better. Uh, I'd, I'd rather um, do it do it backwards. But um, like Darren, I, I, I'm I, I I am conceding that I'm probably in the minority here, and uh, it's. Yeah, I'll, I'll name one comment that I uh, came up with uh, the equity issues. Uh, equity slices both ways. Uh, my, my kid at home on a day when there's a snow day is still getting some educational content in front of him. I'm asking him to read for 20 minutes. I'm asking him to do some math problems. I'm asking him to do something that's educational. And so on emergency days where there are snow days, Equity slices both ways. For a family that can't facilitate an educational experience for their child on a day where there is uh, an emergency day from school, uh, this is a beneficial experience for a lot of students. Um, it's not gonna be perfect one way or another, but what, I, what I've heard the argument being is this is inequitable because some students don't have access to e-learning at home or digital access, or don't have a supportive parent at home that can sit with them to uh, work with uh, work through the content that also goes the other way and so it's not 100 and zero uh, and I don't know which which percentage it is but I just want to name the fact that students do need people to speak on that on behalf of them on the other side of that coin it's not a one-sided coin um, and then uh, I do want to defend the administration here for a second when uh, we got the email saying that the survey was going to go out to the community I responded and suggested some changes to the survey we put a pause on the survey for a day there was a 24-hour window to provide additional feedback. Um, and so uh, it wasn't, it was initially framed as a one hour turnaround. So I uh, agree with that, that's too short of a time frame. But at that point, we did have uh, another day to be able to provide more comments. Right, but I, as I understood, the question was going to be rewritten and the question was exactly the same on the second day. What was changed was that we added a, what do you call it? An open-ended response. Uh, a, a cell where you could write an open end cell. We didn't, nothing about the question changed. That was my understanding between day one and day two was the question was going to be rewritten. What, what was suggested by uh, two members, um, one member suggested that we leave open ended comments um, in defense of questions can get misinterpreted. In, in, so that's why I think open ended comments are extremely helpful. The next thing was a request to make sure that our families had a chance to read the plan prior to uh, taking the survey and then also um, to point out that it would not mirror a typical school day and make sure that we had those um, times uh, up there. And, and so we did um, link that, uh, link the plan inside the survey itself and put the times up there just to, to be clear and then uh, put that open-ended form in there. So that was our interpretation. Um, I will say uh, things move extremely quick in August, uh, especially with all of this. So I think this is a good lesson learned for all of us in terms of, um, you know, when, when we go into our um, self-evaluation in terms of uh, board superintendent, how we can, you know, make sure that we agree on, you know, adequate timelines and, and, and to make sure that the board has uh, enough time to review. And Karad, I did what, I, I just did want to respond to, to one thing you said um, with regards to uh, same thing. My, my kids have been doing math packets this summer and they read every day and that kind of stuff as well and I know that's not, that's not true everywhere. Um, but what I think you'll find if you look at some of the high schools that have been doing this for a couple of years now, it's, it's the kids that you're worried about that are not showing up on the days that they do remote learning. And, and um, so I think when we, some of the ways that we talk about equity is now not only maybe aren't they not getting the help you've got those kids that are, are trying to be there but but not quite getting what they need but then you also have a, a, a set of kids that just might not be there and so you're, you're letting them fall behind I think that's where some of our con our concerns are and I think um, we don't know yet whether that gets elevated at, at the younger kids age you know or if uh, 
if maybe at the high school level that's more elevated because they get a little bit more more freedom in the day you know they just stay home alone you know or whatever we're not usually leaving a uh, a seven-year-old home alone so um, just a lot of unknowns I think that's where where that came from just to, to give you a little bit of clarity from where we but I appreciate the point all right I'm resting anybody else all right appreciate it um, Kevin you want to go roll uh, make sure I have the right motion here <laughs> yeah, this is where Melissa down. comes in just give me one sec here okay member Doshi hi where else is absent member Hannes hi member Harris hey Member Olchak? Aye. Member Weiner? Aye. And Member Hughes? Nay. Uh, the motion carried to approve the e learning plan for school year 21 22, 22 23, and 23 24 as presented. Next up, we have a Google Workspace contract. Is there a motion to approve the, the Google Workspace contract as uh, presented? So moved. Second. All right, any discussion on that? All right. Please go roll. Member Olchek. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. And Board President Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the Google Workspace contract as presented. All right. We have a couple of announcements. Uh, please make note of these dates. Uh, Monday, August 30th at 3.45 p.m. is the district leadership team meeting. Uh, do you know where that's located? District leadership team will be at O'Neill. O'Neill at O'Neill Middle School. Uh, Friday, September 10th at 7 a.m. will be the next financial advisory committee meeting, which will take place at the ASC building. And then uh, Monday, September 13th at 7 p.m. will be the next regular board meeting at Village Hall. Uh, last notes, I do not have any reason to go into closed. Does that still hold? That is true. All right, then. I move to adjourn. <laughs> um, all right, do I have a second? Second. All right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Please call roll. Member Harris. Yes, uh, aye. Member Olchak. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. And Board President Hughes. Aye. The motion carried. The meeting is now adjourned here at 8.14 p.m.